call our work session for the EMID board, uh, if we can. Our first order of business is a presentation uh, by Sue Mackert, Executive Director of the Perfect Center. Ms. Mackert. Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? No, we can't Is that better? Yes. Good. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Moore, EMID staff, legislators, EMID families, students, friends, and anyone I may have missed. My name is Sue Mackard, and I'm very pleased to be here this evening to talk about the partnership between Kirkridge and EMID. I'm going to get regulated now. Joining me are members of the Kirkridge leadership team, Dr. Pamela Paulson, if you just raise your hand. Senior Policy Director, Jeff Pridey, Director of Professional Development and Outreach, Sue Wickham, Human Resources Director for the State of Minnesota Department of Administration, Dr. Calandria Hines, Arts High School Director, Deborah Kelly, Senior Director of Communications, and Mike Zabel, Administrative Management Director. Is my time up? <laughs> <laughs> You submitted 12 questions um, and asked that I respond to them during this meeting. And I'm going to begin with a very brief overview of the Perfect Center. And I apologize, but the slide, the screen is behind you. Um, but I started with the Perfect Center in East Metro logo because I truly do and always have seen this as a strong partnership. And that has been my approach. The Perfect Center for Arts Education is a state agency. It was created in 1985 to promote access to and opportunities for arts education for all Minnesota students, teachers, and schools. And we do this through three divisions, professional development and outreach, a statewide library, and the arts high school. Uh, to give you just a little bit of information, I'm not going to read everything on the slides, but professional development and outreach is the part of the agency that works with teachers in schools across the state. Uh, last year, for example, we were in contact with over 13,000 teachers and administrators and teaching artists whose educators reached more than a quarter million students. We accomplished our mission and assistance of teachers and cultural artists and relationships with about 800 organizations, including institutions of higher education. For example, we recently completed an intensive workshop on Native American studies for educators to increase their knowledge, sensitivity, awareness on the histories, cultures, and languages of federally recognized tribes and bands in Minnesota with the intent, of course, increasing their effectiveness in working with the American Indian student population and teaching American Indian content to all students in the slide that's up shows some of the school districts that were in participation, uh, curriculum directors, administrators, and teachers. We did that in conjunction with St. Cloud State University and their American Indian Studies program. We also do quite a bit of uh, just normal integration programs, uh, teaching the differences between diversity and integration, um, talking about uh, disseminating multicultural and culturally responsive resources and models designed to really address the needs of Minnesota students. Um, this initiative began back in 2000 and has continued building a network of educators and artists and teachers, community organizations and specialists. And again, it was recognizing the need for a transformation in Minnesota's education system to respond to the changing demographics in the state and the growing achievement gap. For example, with some schools, i.e. in Worthington, Minnesota, had quite an influx of uh, Latino students and families and wanting to know how to deal with those, and so they called upon us on how to, how to reach them, and we helped them with the arts in reaching students, and we, that's why we, we know the power of arts education and what it is able to do. In the St. Paul's and Minneapolis schools, we've done a great deal with the Hmong, African American, Somali, Hispanic, and Native American communities. communities. 
um, in professional development and outreach, we establish regional centers really based on needs throughout the state. And, and my point here is to help uh, convey to you our work in the whole state and our ability to disseminate and distribute information. Westbrook Walnut Grove, for example, was established as a regional center for us because they had such a large influx of Hmong uh, families that now represents 42% of their school students. And so, again, using the arts to help them communicate and be excited about learning. Elk River, because they had a large influx of Native uh, American, Chicano, Latino, and, um, and poverty students from poverty. In Albert Lee, same thing, large influx of Chicano, Latino. In Duluth, uh, Duluth is one of our newer regional centers. Uh, again, looking at the large influx of Native American students and the struggle they have with the achievement gap. It is their lowest um, ethnic group in terms of graduation rate. We did this also to be able to spread information for local decision making and better distribution of state dollars for emerging needs in communities throughout because we recognize that it is different throughout Minnesota. What we bring is the consistency of programs and the ability to teach teachers on how to, to deal with these changing demographics. Um, we have a great deal of research and direct application that enables us to help them sustain, evaluate, and really further develop programs. That's part of what we would hope to do, not only at Crosswinds, but with the EMID schools, too. Um, we also have some school districts that are participating in, an, I won't call it an experimental, but it's a, it's a newer program dealing with arts integration across the curriculum that embeds arts throughout, that deals with curriculum development, full assessment tools, standards, achievement, and we started in the Lakes Country area in Fergus Falls and <coughs> districts around there. We added southeastern Minnesota, and this year, with uh, special funding, we will probably do one in northern Minnesota. We also look, when we're planning our programs uh, around the state, at um, MDE, the Minnesota Department of Education does an annual survey, and the slide you are looking at are the school districts from the EMID area that all requested on our survey in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, requested assistance from the Perfect Center um, for things such as implementing art standards, designing e effective arts and arts integrated curriculum, designing assessments aligned with standards, and building a system to report individual student achievement in the arts. Because everyone is learning on how to effectively use the arts to help reach all students. We know how effective that can be and in reaching the systemic issues that affect student and teacher achievement. So your schools, um, your school districts have asked for help and have been involved in various programs at Perpich throughout the years. We, we expect that having Perpich manage crosswinds would result in, in strong partnerships with the EMIT schools and your superintendent and I have talked quite a bit about those kinds of partnerships and activities. We also have a statewide library. Um, we, we protect that library. We feel quite, um, we've, it's, it's very passionate about having it because the Minnesota Department of Education closed their library a few years ago. And so our library really is the only statewide library for educators and teaching artists and has a tremendous uh, volume of resource materials for teachers that involves everything from curriculum to learning about cultural contacts and folk classroom support. The third aspect of the Perfect Center is the Arts High School. We have 23% students of color, and that does not include the high poverty areas. One of the best things about the Arts High School is having students from all over the state. You really have a sense of what's happening in school districts across. And it also is part of what causes us to be so passionate and so student focused because we only have them for two years. So when they come to us, some are very unprepared for graduation and for school. And we have two years to not only get them in place for graduation, but also fulfill their desired need to do more in the arts. 
Uh, we had 100% graduation last year, no small feat considering, again, how they come to us. Um, again, very unprepared, and two years is not a lot of time when students are so far behind in some of their coursework and in some of their grades. Our focus really is on 21st century skills development. They learn how to critically think and problem solve, how to communicate and collaborate, and how to create and innovate. I was pleased at a, at a hearing yesterday, um, education policy that, that um, Dr. Orfield from the U presented and talked about how it has to go beyond the three R's, and we do go beyond the three R's. They're still important, but you, we have to integrate, not be stag stagnant in any way, and add the, the four C's as we, as we call them. So we're always innovating, even though the arts high school has some very solid programs, we too cannot afford to be stagnant and recognize that students come to us with different needs, and so adding the programs such as art science, which is an international program. We are one of three in the United States. The other seven schools are international. But to have our students be able to work with them to see what students around the world are doing is really very important and speaks to the, that global initiative of preparing students for the 21st century. It's also why we have forged programs um, in China, in Ghana, and in Europe and hope to be able to share some of those, especially I was very tickled and brought some of my board members here uh, a short time ago and the science room was full of posters on energy and energy happens to be next year's theme for art science. So I'm, I'm very interested. It's an entrepreneurial program where students spend the year developing ideas and products and then they meet in Europe and they all discuss 23 teams from around the country this year. It's, it's phenomenal. So that gives you a sense of what we're about. It, it's, it is uh, multifaceted. It's a huge mission. It's one that we have um, streamlined and worked very effectively in order to deliver services across the state of Minnesota. So now let's get into some of your questions. Enrollment projections. I heard from one of the Eman family members that um, in a recent survey, 87% of respondents indicated they would remain here in Crossman's families. Um, obviously our intent is to recruit and to recruit additional students. It always has been part of the intent to stabilize and recruit. You have enrollments of 71 currently in 6th grade, 78 in 7th grade, 85 in 8th grade, 52 in 9th, and 36 in 10th. We look forward to those 52 in 9th grade moving into 10th grade. We're also very realistic. We know that because of everything that has happened, that some students will choose not to, not to come back here, but we're prepared for that. We, we are still shooting for a base of, of 300 students. Um, we have a marketing plan that includes such things as uh, going to, we're involved in the, with the Minnesota Science Museum tomorrow. Um, should you vote affirmatively, we expect to be at Crosswinds tomorrow evening for the carnival to play, oh yeah, and to recruit. Um, again, should you vote in the affirmative for Perpage, um, there is an EMID parent meeting scheduled for Sunday, scheduled with the idea that, that we would be talking about uh, the opening of Crosswinds. And we're meeting with select leaders of ethnic parent groups next week. And then the other thing that is a real flagship always for the Perpage Center is the State Fair. <gasps> Those glorious days of morning, noon, and night, um, but it's a wonderful recruitment tool and uh, a good place to explore things. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other recruitment aspects later, but um, we will be recruiting. We do have a solid plan in place, and one of the first things we do is work with Crosswinds Principal Brian to look at applications that are in place for next year and current families so that we send letters to let them know that we will be here next year, depending on your vote. Of great value, of course, are the EMIT families and students. They are just superb. On student racial and ethnic projections, 
for the time being, uh, all I can really say is that um, it's going to be somewhat similar to where you are now. However, we do want to grow students of color. Um, as a state agency, we have the um, ability to collaborate with four state agencies that represent Minnesota's communities of color. Um, all carry education as an area of focus. And these include the Chicano Latino Affairs Council, the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, the Council on Black Minnesotans, and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. At a meeting that I had with the director of the uh, Chicano Latino Affairs Council, we talked a lot about education because he was aware that research into, that he had showed that arts education reaches students, and he's very concerned about um, his students, um, according to MDE, the 2010 graduation rate for Chicano Latino students was 49%. The dropout rate is three times that of white students. And yet it's a population that is estimated to continue to grow at rapid rate, you know, in the country that's become the, the number one, uh, the majority population. In Minnesota from 2000 to 2010, um, the the Chicano Latino community grew by 75%. Um, the director is eager to do whatever he can. He was unaware of the school, and many of the others were as well. And so they're willing to do whatever they can to, to help get some of their students who need to be placed in a specialized school to do so. So we will recruit directly among our ethnic populations so that they know this option exist and I know that in your school districts your populations are changing too so the point is to be able to reach all. In grade configuration you had a question on what would it be and what would the class size be. Um, we had always maintained that we would keep 6 through 10 even though Harambe is starting 6th grade. Um, our intent is to keep 6 through 10 and uh, class size is going to uh, range really from about 10 to 24. Um, I understand that some teachers here like larger classes uh, and that certainly will be supported. We feel that larger classes do allow for some good cross-learning opportunities through interactive discussions. You know there's no real definitive research that indicates small class size is more effective. It, it still comes down to the teacher in the classroom, the culture, the environment, and um, we try to cap at 24, but um, it will really be in accordance to uh, curriculum need. At Purpage, we have established that a class size smaller than 10 is not cost effective unless equipment dictates. In some of our art areas, we have certain equipment that has to be used, and, and it is that dictates the class size. In media, we have 20 juniors because we have 20 uh, major computer systems set up for their photography and design. In one music class, we have seven because we have seven studios for that particular class. So it will vary, but as much as possible, I expect class size to increase somewhat here, um, but it will depend on the final enrollment and then what we do with that. But we, we do have experience with class size. I've asked Dr. Hines to talk about the, the next three areas because I didn't want you to get tired of hearing me. So I'm going to I hold the mic for her or trade places as trade places. And then I will come back. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address you. Um, the question that was asked was um, the equity and integration plan. In effort to to preserve what Crosswinds is here to do, we will be more and we will continue the foundation of Crosswinds, which is the intentional integration of, of students through the curriculum. Um, we will ensure that that students have access to highly effective teachers, making sure that they are um, culturally competent in in an effort to address the cultural needs and identifying the what what works best with the students and valuing their 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 strengths and their skills and their voices. Um, we will ensure that all decisions that are that have an impact on the curriculum are based on the mission and the vision of Crosswinds. We will do our best to build on the students' assets and the values that they bring into the classroom. 
The question in regards to what curriculum will we have for the regular and um, special ed students, the curriculum that will be provided will be designed to integrate students um, as in the current practice that is, that is currently in place here at Crosswinds. Students will all students will, will be provided rigor with support as needed. Um, the current focus of Crosswinds will remain, so it will remain an arts and science focus. Um, students that require special education services will be placed in their least restrictive environments, ensuring that um, they are mainstreamed in order to, uh, in order for their voices also to be heard and their perspectives brought into the classroom. As much as possible, we will have um, co-teaching. So, if there is a need to embed a, a special ed teacher into a regular in a regular ed education class in order to provide the least restrictive service, least restrictive environment for a special ed student that will also be supported. A question in regards to the um, providing education support to students. Um, I will have to say that I am a product of EMID. I um, used to work at for Roseville Area High School. I was the AVID coordinator um, when AVID first began in Roseville. So I had ex much experience in the professional development with the affinity groups and um, the professional development that were provided to the teachers of color in support of the students of color as we were in in engul engulfed into the classrooms in order to teach. So. In, in the area, it, it's very humbling and it's dear to my heart to make sure that we meet the needs of all students. So if, a, if there are students that require ESL services, um, special education plans, IEPs, 504s, we will do what we need to do in order to meet the needs of all students. Those are my questions. Your next question dealt with transportation. And um, again, all students attending Crosswinds will have access to transportation services. Uh, similar pickup points as now uh, for those students within the 10 member district with financing directly from MDE to Perpix. That's really the only change. You know, when we started this, part of the whole thing too was as much consistency as we could provide for families. So um, it changes the financing. The school districts do not, will not be billed from EMID. The financing will come directly to us from MDE. Those who choose to select open enrollment, I know some of you had a question on open enrollment. We will accept open enrollment. Um, and the same as most school districts, they, if they, they can be transported from a school within the EMID member school districts and we will provide for that. Hiring teachers, the first thing I would like to do is just simply recognize that we, we know that we will lose a lot of the current teachers, that they have had to uh, move on for a, a number of reasons, and, and that is a great loss. However, they always will have, um, should you choose to select Purpage, first choice to come back. And, um, and that, I just want to state on behalf of teachers how proud we are of them and what they've done here. Um, we will begin immediate recruitment and review resumes. We have seen uh, some individuals have um, sent resumes because uh, they have been really since the legislative session started because they had heard that this might happen and we always get quite a mix. One of the benefits of our working throughout the state is we tend to know what's happening where in terms of uh, schools making budget cuts in academic and arts teachers and we do our best to try to facilitate matching and so we do have some resumes and um, the strength of our reputation will, will be helpful. Even though the teaching staff will likely have many new faces, what we are experienced with our, in our professional development and what we intend to do is to protect the culture and the program and to bring in professional development so that uh, teachers that are hired maintain, again, consistency and value of program. Um, we excel in professional development for teachers. And um, I'm honestly not at all concerned about filling those 
positions, and I would like to introduce Sue Wickham, who is here with us this evening. Sue is with the state, the Department of Administration, and they are on board and know they know me and and, and um, know that it will be uh, intense but very doable. So we will begin that process. It's our goal to have all teachers on board by the time school opens, or at least by September 1. Um, it doesn't, uh, even if it means offering some of our uh, other um, teachers through PDR or the Arts High School that work with us um, on special assignment until staffing reaches full level. We have a teacher, for example, who retired and she called immediately and said, I'd like to come back. She's a wonderful teacher. And so I am really not at all concerned about that. I, I feel that the state HR team is in place and ready to assist and um, we will do professional development and we will do, we will protect the culture and the program that's here. The next question dealt with administrative positions. And again, I want to recognize that we're going to lose some very good administrators from Crosswoods. But I want to assure you that we're going to also gain some very good administrators for Crosswoods. We do have a principal identified. We also have a professional development director identified. We have finance staff identified to supplement the current staff. And we have HR in place. So as soon as the, the contract, if, if the contract is approved, then we will begin that immediate filling of administrative positions. Um, you asked about Perkridge Board authorization. I couldn't be more proud of the Perkridge Board of Directors. We worked very hard in the last few years to recruit uh, members who have business expertise, legal expertise, financial expertise, just a, a wide range. Our board is established so that there's one representative for, from every congressional district, which really brings in that wonderful flavor of all Minnesota, and then we have at large uh, positions. And they have been involved in this process since we received that phone call in December. A number of them have had the opportunity to meet with your superintendent and to look at this building, and um, they also had a visit from the EMIT families who came to a board meeting to speak, and I think that probably went well. Um, so they, the EMIT families were curious to, to know the board. I am very proud of the board. Um, they voted unanimously when, when the idea of a management contract came forward. They voted unanimously for us to move forward and authorize the board chair and myself to work with you and to see what we can do to um, get an agreement through. And I have tentatively scheduled a board meeting for Friday morning should the result from tonight suggest that Perkridge manage the <coughs> school. So again, I want to thank the EMID staff and the superintendent for helping with our board members too. They are very excited. There was a question on our plan in terms of reporting to MDE and EMIP, and I also include our Perpage Board in, in that, that we would also be reporting to the Perpage Board. In the contract, you see that we had indicated full cooperation for all reports that EMIP has to file for with MDE. Um, I would prefer regular reports to the EMIP Board because I see this as a partnership and I think you need to know what we're doing. It's not just the school, it's the whole program. Um, I would operate in partnership with EMID leadership. That has always been part of the original plan too. And I would hope at some point we would have a joint meeting of the Perfect Center and, and um, it actually I goofed, it's not, it's not the Crossroads Board, Perfect Center and the EMID Board. Um, because I think that in a partnership, you it, the, the more you know about decision making and who's making these decisions, the, the stronger it is. Um, so I also expect and to maintain EMID families in terms of reporting to the public and let them know our progress as well, because I think they'll tell us anyway. 
I added a, a question on funding because I know that I would guess that some of you share some of the same concerns that we've had from the beginning as we've looked through um, all of the numbers and hashed all of the numbers since day one. It hasn't really uh, changed from the legislative process, but because that's when we really dissected numbers. And I have a very strong finance committee of um, business people that did the same. And what we looked at at funding is we will use all categories of education funds available. Um, the commissioner has been warned as such and supportive of such, and um, as has EMID. But in addition to the per pupil, one of the things that helps us is that we'll have access to some pots of money that Crosswinds does not now have access to, and that would be helpful. So compensatory, integration, transportation, special ed, among other funds, and I, I must acknowledge and provide um, a shout out to Sherry, who has been instrumental, and to Jan, who's been instrumental in, in helping with MDE and also looking at opportunities for additional funds. And in our last figures, we came up 100,000 to the good, and that is good. That when we looked at all the available funds, and remember that when we went through the legislative process, legislators asked for a fiscal note that's common in, in coming with a, a bill so that they know what the cost is to the state of Minnesota. And believe me, I had a number of questions regarding that. And one of the things we did was just simply have MMB, Minnesota Management and Budget, the finance group, and MDE, Department of Ed, really dissect and determine what those would be. And they are the ones who came up with the um, budget neutral. Now, I, when I first met with you in January when I made the proposal, um, I had not had time, as your superintendent is aware, to really have done our due diligence. And I provided a figure of, the, a question was raised on how much more money would you need from the legislature, and I indicated that we would probably need two to three million. And, and it was kind of taken a little out of context in that we do need an additional two to three million, not from the legislature, but on top of the backpack monies. And so when we had time after that meeting, when you approved us going forward and we met with EMIT staff, um, then we looked at the other sources of funds that, that you have. So I, I apologize for not explaining myself better at that meeting, but that's when we looked. I was thinking of special ed and transportation and things that, that we weren't prepared to fund and, and I would not put the perfect center at risk. And so it was very helpful to have that time to go through the process and look at, at numbers um, to, to see how, how that would come down. And I'm pleased, as I expect you are, that there's a slight increase in the per pupil funding this, in the next few years. But that being said, I will also share with you my philosophy that um, there has to be a greater influx of private dollars. School districts struggle everywhere, and we know that because we work with school districts to help them protect arts programs, and usually that's one of the first that, that hits the chopping block. And, and since Minnesota's deficit of the last few years, education has been at risk. And so I have always said that private dollars to supplement education will be needed. I feel very strongly about that for the Perfect Center and would take that same philosophy into crosswinds. I'm just not going to make any promises that we're going to get this grant or this grant. Have we explored things? Absolutely. Because one of the things I heard right away from parents was we like to restore all of the after school programs. Well, I can't make that promise and told parents that, that from an economic standpoint, unless we raise some additional monies, we're not going to be able to restore everything. Would we like to? Of course we would, but um, you made those cuts for a reason. You made some very, very good, thoughtful cuts, and we won't restore things without having alternative sources of funding. The Perpage Center has a foundation that does help with some things, and they're gearing up to do a lot more fundraising. But again, no promises. Would like to, but I, I just don't feel that it is appropriate for me to do so. It's the same thing with our art science program. We have some 
corporations very interested because they know that it is about 21st century <coughs> jobs, but um, we'll see what comes comes through. And every time I drive and I see that big 3M, you're going to hear from us really soon. Um, so that handles uh, some of the issues that we've looked at on funding. I wanted to end with talking a little bit about what I consider to be Perpich EMID partnership. And again, this has been my approach from the from the very beginning, that I appreciated being invited by EMID to consider us taking over crosswinds um, because of the synergy of our missions. I know that you want young people to succeed as much as we want young people to succeed. Our statewide network is helpful, and we want to be able to take this model of crosswinds and do something with that. We will support your decision. The first question I had when invited to submit a proposal was, what does the board want? And I was told, outside proposals to see if somebody is willing to keep the school open. And so that has always been my focus and, and how I entered this. We came into it with an understanding that collectively, EMID wanted to be out of the school operation business in order to distribute more funds to each school district to manage greater EMED-led integration programs. So we went approach, we responded, and we did so after really carefully looking at who we were and what we are in arts education and our service, because I feel as though our agency, like any other state agency, um, belongs to all of you. It belongs to all of us. We're a service agency and concluded that Crosswinds fits well within our mission. We understand the student profile of Crosswinds. We understand the state's investment in integration. We understand the impact of an arts integrated curriculum. We excel in professional development for teachers and administrators, particularly on issues of cultural context and integration. And we feel without question we can deliver a winning situation for all of your schools. Our intent was fairly simple, to maintain the operation of Crosswinds Arts and Science Middle School, to bring our professional development expertise to train current and new teachers using this wonderful model that you have established. We're not going to build dormitories or to open a second arts high school. There is no need to do that. One arts high school is sufficient. And our preference, quite honestly, has always been to help school districts maintain their students. That's why setting up our regional <coughs> centers, that local decision making is, is really, really very important. When I sat on a hospital board, we all concluded that, you know, local health care is better. Well, it's the same in education, that that local aspect really is very important. And so our emphasis, which becomes somewhat <coughs> Um, conflicting if you hear it, but it works, is to maintain this arts high school as a residential statewide school, while at the same time using our full professional development to go out into school districts to help them keep their students um, through arts education. Um, it's, it's the arts high school and Crosswinds and Harambe remind us that a small percentage of students are better reached by specialized schools. And that's really a very important factor, especially as um, demographics and other things change, that we just simply recognize that. It doesn't mean that we don't understand budgets and priorities. I'm a very pragmatic leader who has served on a number of boards, uh, as I mentioned, hospital to bank to United Way to Chamber of Commerce. So I understand the dual role all of you play in protecting the interests of your school districts while supporting a mission of integration, the purpose of EMIN. Um, and that calls for programs in which all students can achieve. Um, I feel that Perfect Center is offering a win-win solution in response to what you have requested and also in response to what some of the districts need. When I first met with the superintendent of South Washington County, for whom I have a great deal of respect, we talked about 
um, the, the potential of an arts magnet school over there somewhere, where his, where his population was growing and where the need was greater. And that's a natural for us to, to help set up that kind of thing, that that's the kind of partnership. I don't view it as competition. I don't view Perpich as competition. What I view us as is we're here to help school districts and we're here to provide education that works for all students. Um, so what I'm asking of you is to put on your email collaborative hat tonight and make a decision that really does put your students first in order to further this integration model that even began. It was and continues to be a very good idea. And with our knowledge and expertise in delivering statewide, we have always felt from the beginning that we could take this model and duplicate and replicate. And, and we think that that's of benefit. We hear about the achievement gap in Minnesota, and Minnesota has marvelous teachers and strong, strong education, but we do have some issues and we need to be able to, all of us collectively as educators, help address those issues. And we think that this is one of the ways to do it. It's not just about keeping Crosswinds open as a school. It's about doing much more than that. And that's why as a state agency, we were interested that that statewide connection is so very, very important. We think that EMIT can be such strong leaders in, in taking that good idea and furthering it, that that should be your legacy. And all we're asking to do is let us help. So I think I have answered your questions and may have generated a few more in the process. So at this time, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for your, uh, for your presentation and covering the um, interview questions to the extent that you did. Um, we'll open it up to board members who wish to either ask questions um, off the interview sheet or perhaps a little bit more detail if that's what would help. Um, at this time, uh, I think that'd be appropriate. So are there additional questions from any board members? Marilyn. Of course. <laughs> when you talk about you try it, this. when you talked about enrollment projections, is it on? When you talked about enrollment projections, you said 78% of respondents were interested in coming, retaining. Uh, what was the portion of respondents? I, Surveys don't always have very high percentages of respondents. Yeah. I apologize. I didn't commission or ask for the survey, and I think that the EMID families probably should respond to that because all I heard was what they said in terms of 87%. So perhaps... Um, I can fill in, in a couple of forums at that point. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> He'll talk about it as well. Okay. Do you have more? No. Go ahead. Um, you commented in curriculum that you anticipate continuing the arts and science curriculum. I was wondering what your thinking was in terms of how much of the curriculum that is here today versus how much of the curriculum you have experience from, from Perpich or other venues that you anticipate bringing here. Anticipate um, continuing on with the current curriculum that is in place here at, at Crosswinds. Looking at the um, IB program and the middle years program and how it is it is immersed in the different cultures, um, and with the intentionality of integration, it is a perfect fit to continue that cut that um, curriculum. It it doesn't mean see, I just can't resist. It doesn't mean we won't introduce some new programs depending on the final enrollment and the types of students and the students that might need motivation differently, such as the art science program and, and other aspects. We'll get this over to you.
I had similar concerns on the enrollment, and I came tonight hoping I'd, I'd hear more definitive answers as to what that would pertain. I, I didn't hear that yet. Um, the enrollment was 87% would stay on, but what is the current population right now? 87% 87 of what? Three hundred and thirty-five, and so that hole still is a big hole to fill. Well, and and you did mention um, pots of money. I'm just wondering where the pots of money are that you talked about. Um, within the Department of Education. Okay, so it would be statewide money that would yes. be additional yes. ways, and that would that was always my second concern. And then just one more because I'm sure there's others that have other better questions. You said they're way behind sometime when they come to you. And I would imagine hearing you at one point say it's very pretty hard to get into the Purpage School. So I'm wondering if it's pretty hard to get in, what are the qualifications if you're needing to take people who are way behind? I'm really glad you asked that because when the legislature established the Purpage Center, in, for those who come as juniors, there is no GPA requirement. So you could have failed all of your academic classes and still be a candidate for purpose. There, there's no requirement. And so we have to look at every individual person. If you come in as a senior, you have to have a 2.0. So when they're behind, part of what I'm addressing are the classes that we used to teach biology, for example, in 10th grade. It's not done in, in many school districts anymore, so they come without that credit. So on top of their normal junior and senior credits and uh, their desire to study in the arts, we have to then find room to do ninth and 10th grade subject matters that they have not had, phi ed, health, and biology especially. And, and they tend to be behind in some other areas, so we do tutoring and math and a few other things, but that, that's what I meant. There's a shift in what's taught in ninth and 10th grade now. I'm glad with that ninth and 10th, you're only considering up until the eighth, or that 10th, I'm sorry. And so where do you presume that the rest of the students, I, I, being here as long as I have, I always thought that was one reason why the enrollment was falling, because the kids had to go to a different high school and they're 11 and 12, and so I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to make that a better situation. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because it's one of the things that has always concerned us in the nearly 30 years of the Arts High School because I, when we have information sessions and we speak to parents, inevitably you'll have students that, yes, I'm going to the Arts High, and the parents go, but I want you to graduate from my school. And they have to make a very difficult decision to leave their home schools after 10th grade and come for 11th and 12th. And, and what happens is they come to the Arts High because of the environment and the culture. They're so immersed in their learning that it doesn't take them long at all to feel comfortable and to not have regrets. And I suspect it's the same here, that some of the things that we've learned in our studies of our students is that it forced them to make personal decisions, good personal decisions earlier. And I think that with Crosswind's history, the students do leave here after 10th grade, some, and they go all over. They, some come to the Arts High, some, they go all over. And I think that they're prepared to do that. And I, I think that with the mobility of students and the interest, if we maintain their interest, they, then wherever they end up, that continues. That's why when I spoke to the Crosswind students uh, toward the end of the legislative session, and they were very concerned about having to choose a new school, what I did was encourage them and say, you're going to be okay because you take the spirit of Crosswinds with you. And so there are a number of ways that, that we help students feel secure so that they can make that change and be better prepared when they leave one school system and go to another. Again, keeping on the theme of student uh, retention and uh, enrollment and the like, uh, Rumbry is going to be offering a sixth grade, and this might be a question for Sherry, first of all. 
Uh, currently, what percentage of our sixth grade population comes from Harambe? I would say Kathy may help with this. It's, it's a little over half. Yeah, 60 to 65 percent. Many of our sixth graders that come to Crosswinds, our sixth grade population, are actually students that have not been enrolled at Harambe. Okay, but but 60 to 65 percent of your sixth graders are from Harambe. Is that what you're saying? 60 to percent of our current sixth graders at Harambe go on, go on to Crosswinds. It doesn't make up 60 to 65 percent of our sixth grade population at Crosswinds. Okay, because my concern, sorry, because yeah. my, my concern is that Harambe is going to be offering sixth grade as well next year. Are we going to lose a lot of what would potentially be Crosswind students to who decide to stay at Harambe? Of the entire sixth grade, um, I estimate that Harambe students are typically thir about 35% of our sixth grade population in years past. And do you know what that 35% of uh, current Harambe fifth graders are planning on going to Harambe for sixth grade? Well, I think right now, I actually have a couple more questions about enrollment. Um, I think that if I was hearing correctly that you were basing your budget on a base of 300 students? Yes. And with that 300 students, you're looking at a, at a potential $100,000 budget surplus? We were. Okay. Yes, okay. we were. And part of what we've discussed in the management team, of course, is that if fewer students, we're pretty optimistic. Um, but we're also realistic, and we've looked at other numbers as fewer students come, then so too fewer expenses and operating costs. Okay. So with, and, and I mean, $100,000 uh, budget reserve is good. What, what are you looking at for a maximum enrollment, potential maximum enrollment at Crosswinds? When we uh, first proposed Crosswinds, what we, we proposed 350 for our first year and um, when we were going through the legislative process. And so I, I don't think of anything that might um, change that number. We had proposed 350 with a growth of approximately 50 per year in that process, and I think we would stay with that. That, you know, we'd love to see 350 this year, but somewhere between 300 and 350 would be fine. Um, but what about in the future? Are you, are you looking at keeping it at 350 or would you potentially hope to grow it to what? We would hope to grow it. It's my understanding that even though it has capacity for 600, that that really stretches the building. So what we had proposed is, and again, um, we're, just, we're just speaking one year here, but dreaming of other years, we had proposed increasing it by 50 each year. So. That was the proposal. So to, we'd, to what? We'd, to we'd, a go up, we'd go up to a maximum of 550. Okay. And uh, in your current program with 11th and 12th grade, what what's your percent of special ed students that you that you service now that have IEPs? Seven percent. Seven. I'm sorry, 17%. 17%? 504s. In, including 504s? Yes. Okay. And how about ELL? We have none. Okay. But you do have a plan to service ELL students? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We've had them in the past. Again, at Kirkage, it's up and down. One that goes along that enrollment theme on 
both ends uh, in terms of the expected enrollment for this fall, and you're saying 300. However, what would be the floor? What would be the bare minimum that you'd be able to open this school? With? And is there a possibility we'd be facing that? Well, we aren't going to face that, but no. in, in reality, yes, of course, we've discussed that uh, 200 would be a bare minimum, and it depends, it's going to depend on the, on the distribution of classes and what's needed for teaching, but I'm, I'm shooting for 300. But you're, shooting yes. for, you're shooting for 300, but if parents we, who are, and, and a lot of parents in this very room, are very, very desirous of purpose opening right here uh, in the fall, and uh, I don't, I don't like to be a worst case scenario type presenter, yeah. but the, the fact is, this is July 10th, and no one can predict the future. Uh, yeah. If you were to only have 200 students walking through the door in the fall, uh, can we provide a viable program that, well, looking out at the audience, like they would like? First of all, I'll say that regardless of number of students, the program will be viable. Is it ideal at 200? No, it isn't ideal. Will it be viable? Yes. And that's part of the, the benefit of having the uh, Perfect Center in connection with it, that we, we can do some shifting. I'm not speaking of uh, the Arts High School as much as just the full agency itself, that we have looked at different scenarios. We, um, our leadership team throughout this has raised our own internal concerns and pragmatism as well as board members and it will be a viable program it isn't ideal so what we're going to do is do everything we can to hit a higher mark right. then on the other end um, as the kids progress through crosswinds during the next school year and in subsequent years with purpose running this school uh, what would, and, and my understanding is that uh, coming to Crosswinds as part of the Perpich Center for the Arts uh, is not a uh, automatic, uh, is the term, articulation to... Uh, to Perpich. To Perpich. Correct. And, and as a matter of fact, I would guess that the percentage of students that will be attending the, the Crosswinds facility uh, a relatively small percent will go on to your school, your that purpose school. Now, having said that, uh, what kind of work do you anticipate to do in terms of pathway, or providing pathways for these 10th grade graduates who are looking for 11th grade and 12th grade uh, spot, and uh, one of the things I think that some of the member districts may or may not have been concerned about over the years is that I think, well, I think we, I can speak for all 10 of us when we say we like to have those folks come back to our district. Uh, and that does not mean to say that we would be denying anybody any choice to go anywhere else, to a charter school or, or to Perfect or wherever. However, uh, have you got ideas in terms of working closely with the member districts to make sure that if we're getting kids coming out of a 10th grade environment and they're still very, very interested in the arts, that you have, and, can, and you said before that you're willing to help us. You don't want to be in competition with us. So for instance, and most of you know I'm from St. Paul, <laughs> we have a creative arts high school. Uh, I would like to think that kids coming out of the 10th grade here at Crosswinds would be encouraged, certainly by St. Paul, <laughs> to come to the Creative Arts High School in St. Paul. In the meantime, the fact that they went to Crosswinds as middle school kids, uh, I don't think we would necessarily have to look at that. I hope we wouldn't 
have to look at that as a competitive kind of thing rather than more of a collaborative type thing. Now, I know my question was very, very, very long. Oh, no, it's really quite easy. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Because, again, with the focus on student, um, as I understand it, um, crosswinds now, I don't expect those numbers to change radically uh, from where they are right now. That, as I understand it, there is a, a fair that is held and the EMIT schools attend that fair and recruit. And, and we would want that um, because, it, again, the intent is not to take students. We feel good. Our job, if we're doing our job, then they're prepared to go anywhere. And, and that's why one of the first things I told the parent group is this is not a feeder to the arts high school. We do not need a feeder. It's not a feeder that we want to be able to support the 10 districts. And if we're doing the, the partnership, which we would grow into, um, first year crosswinds uh, emphasis, but as we grow into a partnership, your schools are going to be um, very attractive, even more so to the crosswind students, I feel. And it's much like if a school, if one of your schools sets does a new magnet school, well that's good, and we'd be right there in partnership with you setting that up. And so, no, I, d I don't think you're going to see a change in the numbers. And one of the things that we protect, of course, is the fact that the Arts High School is a statewide school, and, we want, and that's part of what makes it so unique is that we have students from all over Minnesota. We would not want to, to jeopardize that at all. Thank you. Uh, as long as the microphone's over here, can you indulge me for my, my other my other question dealt uh, primarily with, uh, uh, as an old teacher, what I'm, I'm also, you know, as I said in September, I'm concerned about those kids walking in the door. Well, I'm also concerned about who's going to be there to greet them. Uh, who's the team in place? And I actually, as an old athletic coach, I have to bear with me with my uh, athletic metaphors or similes or whatever. Because we got to have some shortstops and some second basemen and, and right coaches. fielders and maybe even a pinch hitter here or there when things get going tough. Can I respond to that in a second? Okay, go ahead. No, no, there, there will be more, but go ahead. Again, when I talk about the fact that we, we know the um, um, we know the characteristics of crosswind students because we know the characteristics of arts high students and the individuality and when the arts high students come back they are very welcomed when the new students especially because it's a new environment and we would carry that same philosophy and culture here we want them to feel very welcome we're very cognizant that some of their teachers will be gone and they will feel that and so it is our responsibility and i think the management team would be the first to tell you that we talk about culture and environment and uh, good boundaries, but but warmth and and care for those individual students and crosswinds would have to have an inordinate amount of support. And I think that part of that too is calling on parents to provide assistance. And I I have learned that your parents are not shy. <laughs> No, they're not shy. <laughs> uh, actually, I wanted to form my question around your very good answers to question five, which dealt with curriculum. And uh, I'm pleased to hear the answer to five. And then, of course, if, but as I said before, as a teacher, I'm thinking in terms of the team that's going to present and to present the curriculum. And so, and, and once again, it's July 10th, and we got to get that batting order on a score sheet very soon. And, and I know you did some talking about uh, uh, professional development and your ability to, to work with teachers and, and the fact that there is some, there's a, there's a talent pool out there, we know that. But at the same time, it's, seems to me like there's going to be a lot of work. Tonight's June, July 10th. You're re you want to start tomorrow morning. But 
that started at school year 13-14 is going to be starting very, very soon. And we've got to have not only people hired, but we've got to have people hired that's, that are a fit to the kids that are staying here, that are a fit to the kids that we think we will attract here. Well, you, I, I, don't, I don't have to give you a lecture on pedagogy. I think, can you just be a little bit more specific in terms of how you're going to try? How the hell are you going to do it? <laughs> well, I, I won't sit here and tell you that it's not going to be, um, it, it will not be peaches and cream with the Perfect Center that every staff member, every member of the management team is aware that there will be a great deal of extra work on, on their part, and they're all willing to do that. Um, we have all canceled <clears throat> vacations and, and whatnot, but the way we're going to do that, it's one of the reasons why identifying the leadership team that will be here, uh, that that seemed to be the most important piece to, be able to identify um, a principal, a potential principal, and along with that, a professional development specialist that will be on staff. And it's also why we have uh, Ms. Wickham here from the Department of Administration, that we have a number of HR specialists in the state ready to, to move forward with this, because you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the time frame isn't ideal for any of us, but it seemed that the need to do it outweighs the long days and hours that are going to take place, and we will just put our full capital in gear to make it happen. And I also know from some of the staff members that we're not starting all over, that there will be some people who wish to remain here. And, um, and so that will be helpful. There's going to be some consistency in staffing. And we will rely on that. And we will rely on all stakeholders. We'll rely on the parents. We'll rely on our board, and we'll rely on the EMIT staff. It's going to take all of us. That's why I say this is a partnership. <laughs> and we're all in this together right now because we're trying to make a situation that none of us expected. We're trying to take care of it, and it will take all of us. And I'm really pleased when I get a call from someone who retired and they say, we, we, we're willing to come back. They retired young. But it, it's just, you know, it's hard for teachers to retire because that passion. I, I, I wish I could be more explicit. Thank you. It's always dangerous to hand the microphone to a social studies teacher. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and thanks to my colleagues on this board for asking so many great questions that saved me from asking them and helped me understand a few things. I have a number of questions, so if I could go through that list, that'd be great. Thank you. Some are a little more entailed than others, so I'll start with the easiest one. Maybe I should end with that, but the easiest one, um, and looking at the contract, uh, I, I assume that Crosswinds name will remain the same, but how will that be handled, that publicly marketing, recruitment? The, the Crosswinds name remains the same, and it is still a school of EMID. It's Perpich Management, and um, some individuals have already made that distinction, who have called and, and said, we'll stay if, and so it will be up to us to manage the names. Um, the intent was never to change the name anyway. It's a good name and it, it's there for a reason. It's a still an EMIT school. We're simply doing the management aspect. Well, thank that you. That was easy. Thank it, you. That is the easy question. With the legislature not uh, acting on, on proposed legislation and the request this legislative session, this is um, everyone seeking the same um, resolution, but it's a whole new ball game. It's yes. a different um, road that we're traveling. So that was just a clarification question. It's it's a one-year arrangement. It will have to be uh, examined, I assume, in the following year if the legislature uh, chooses not to take up this subject again next next legislative session. And would you have, I suppose it would 
uh, depend also on enrollment numbers, successes with the program. Uh, do you anticipate an interest in renewing that contract if this remains the same management situation rather than uh, the, um, turning over the governance? Um, I expect that we will have a good partnership and that if the decision is to continue the management agreement that we would likely be very much in favor of that. That in operating this year, we, we can't operate just with the idea that it's one year because then we'll be in the same position next year. And I have great angst for the families and the students and the staff. They need to have some assurance that there's going to be some consistency. Thank you. And longevity. Okay, now wearing my White Bear board member hat, um, I come to these meetings, as do my colleagues, wearing their, their uh, individual school district hat, uh, responsible to uh, represent the interests of our school district, our community, all of our stakeholders, as well as the responsibility pr to provide a good, and solid, uh, rigorous education for all students. That's why we're around this table with EMIT. However, with my white bear hat, then, one of the key messages that, that I see with this that um, is a, a strong point bringing this back to white bear if I were to vote later in the evening to approve this resolution with Perfect, uh, is the concept of the partnership. And I understand the professional development piece of that. I, I, I think that the um, message of partnership may have gotten diluted a bit throughout this process, but it's, it's a very complex process. Um, to me, what would give meaning to the partnership, I think what many people could understand, both the, the community <coughs> stakeholders as well as administration, my fellow board members and my bear, would be a partnership that would be extended to experiential learning within the individual districts in partnership with Purpose. Now, being the shameless promoter I am of White Bear and, and marketing, I can see that with your uh, very well-regarded name and reputation as a selling point for White Bear, big picture. So do you see that as a possibility that wouldn't be forgotten in several months, no criticism intended, oh, no. but something that, that would give meaning to partnership beyond professional development? Um, I'm glad you asked that, Lori, because, because uh, first of all, I'll say that we're first going to get staffing together before we even think outside of this building. But the, one of the reasons we accepted uh, coming before you is we very much believe in our status as a state agency and our huge responsibility to serve the state and school districts. And so the partnership, the experiential learning, uh, in sitting through the legislative session, for example, this last year, we know that legislators want 21st century skills embedded in high school students. In fact, if I recall, there's a piece in the education bill where you have to prove career readiness, okay? So we take that as our responsibility to help, and it's one of the areas, um, because the arts are 21st century, they learn to communicate, they learn to solve problems, and so um, we've been developing curriculum around that, and it's also why we had gone into our art science program. Uh, there's a close relationship between art and science, and that international program deals with taking the creative concepts and merging with the scientific concepts. It's wonderful. And it's something that early on I spoke to, um, it's connected to Harvard, and I told those folks about Crosswinds a long time ago and said that we would be interested in taking that into EMID and into Crosswinds as a prototype because it's just such a valuable program, and um, it really engages students. I, I wish I had had the time to bring the videos that we have showing students engaged in work, because with schools, it's hitting those systemic issues that causes issues in student and teacher achievement. 
but we would work with individual districts. It's one of the things we, we considered. Um, when we spoke to a legislator early on, um, before we had any bills written, but early on, he said, oh, they're going to be so excited to have Perkage there because you'll do things for that area. And I, I kind of looked at this, we all did in the management team, as kind of a regional center approach um, because we never saw Crosslands isolated from any of your schools, that it's part of the schools. Does, does that help? Yes, absolutely, and I, I really think that's an important message. If we can benefit, if both parties can truly benefit from the partnership, and the professional development piece is key, of course it is, but then there's the rest of the community and those who aren't as close to EMED as, as we may be to, to understand what that partnership, to quite honestly be able to use Perpich in our marketing materials for you to use the individual district districts in your marketing materials, I think would serve as well. We have a number of partnerships with great meaning in White Bear Lake that we take pride in that both parties benefit from. For instance, um, McPhail Center for Music. A few short years ago, they were looking to expand beyond their downtown Minneapolis site, which is beautiful and, and wonderful. They're in a charter school down in Egan or Apple Valley, and they were looking to expand in the Northeast Metro. White Bear Lake had an elementary school right off of the interstate, and it had uh, space. So we, uh, we entered into an arrangement with McPhail. They, enter, they provide fee-based classes to the community, weekends and evenings, just as they do downtown Minneapolis. But during the day, they teach our elementary students at Birch Lake Elementary piano and violin without it taking away from our own music education program. So the students at Birch are getting a very rich music arts education here, and we're very lucky. But it, it serves us both well, quite frankly, having McPhail in all of our marketing materials. And um, McPhail has a site in the North Metro that works for us. Another example is the YMCA. We have arrangements with them in our schools with uh, the high quality uh, uh, daycare program, child care programs, but they teach all of our second and third graders throughout the district water safety lessons. And that's a lot of kids in eight elementary schools every year, and this is, I believe, the sixth year. But it works for both of us. We have arrangements. There are many, but those are things that work. The kids are getting experiences. The other entities, the outside entities, are, um, are benefiting as well from the locations, the, the exposure. So uh, I would love to see that as part of Purpose, this <coughs> partnership with Purpich, having the, the students experience what Purpich does within our districts. The other piece of the partnership to help school districts that, that we see as very much a growing need, uh, we've been doing a lot more work with superintendents, principals, and school board members uh, again, because they're trying to handle budget cuts or they have a levy or a bond referenda and um, part of our long-term strategic um, thoughts prior to all of this was to be able to <coughs> offer those services, services beyond traditional school things, but whether it's finance, HR, or passing of levies that we just feel it's so important that the stronger <coughs> The stronger local schools are, the better for everyone. So. We would tend to agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I guess I'll, I'll turn this over. I have one last question. Um, Two, I'm sorry, your, your marketing and recruitment. Now, as much as I wouldn't want to see a, a large full page ad in our local press for Perpich, uh, we do our own marketing as well, so I understand the need to market. Public school districts need to market. Uh, so I understand that, but I, I am leery. I go into this leery of the marketing and recruitment that you'll need to do to ensure enrollment. So that I, that's more a statement than 
no a question. I, I appreciate that, and one of the things that we would do is, first of all, if we're going to come into your community and market, we would let you know, or we'd let the superintendents know. But it's one of the reasons why early on I did meet with all of the superintendents, those who, who they were all invited, and those who came to help explain why <coughs> Purpage was interested in what we would do. And, and I, I believe so strongly in that collaboration and partnership again because we really are a service agency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one last question. It has to do with the contract and then I'll turn it over. Thank you for your patience. It is um, the section under purchaser's duties, the, the GH at the end um, refers to the sole authority to take action on expulsions, etc. of students. So if perhaps Jan could, could explain this uh, to us a, a little better with our authority. Um, I don't have a strong understanding of the authority of this board with the management of that school, so if we could just address that. Thank the you. The students are still our students, and since they are our students, the reporting is done by EMID to the Department of Education, which also includes, as you do in all of your districts, you report disciplinary actions, we would need to continue to do the same. If there should be an event in any one of uh, either Crosswinds or Harambe that would require the board to take action on potential expulsion, it would become before this board with the testifiers and the information provided by the management and operation divisions, which would be Roseville and if Perpich is um, uh, authorized by this board, it would be there. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I appreciate it. You've gone through expulsions at your yes. own board levels, and it would be the same. Okay, yeah. So in reality, I'm sorry, in reality, doing a management agreement has is really beneficial to both parties to start that way. It is. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Um, the first question might be more towards Sherry, but a uh, little help also here. Uh, North St. Paul, we have a large enrollment from North St. Paul. Um, about how many students go to Crosswinds? Um, currently, right now, from North St. Paul, there's probably about 37, I believe. 37, and are they currently <laughs> provided with transportation? Uh, some of those students are because they were grandfathered in mm -hmm. under the agreement if they had started Christmas at Harambe as a kindergartner they are allowed to rent decent transportation until they age out of the program so that would just continue over so to that would continue okay. under the DSEG under the DSEG program okay thank you that was point of clarification and I guess on the interview questions question number 12 as a state agency has Perpich Center for the Arts received authorization from relevant state departments. I guess I didn't hear did clearly if that has been done. Yes, it has. It has. We have um, the Department of Administration signs our contracts, uh, this type of contract, and we work with them. We work with multiple agencies, but in terms of approval of the contract, they have indicated that they will, in fact, should the board should the board approve this, that they will sign the contract. The way it works in the state is the purchaser signs, we sign, and then the state signs. Just as a follow-up to the same question, so you'll be getting the transportation dollars from MDE, the management office and budget, all those elements are taken care of, correct? Yes, um, I believe that Sherry probably has, uh, I don't know that there's anything to share, but Sherry's been in contact with MMB and they have put their seal of approval on both Harambe and Crosswinds. We were mostly concerned with the Department of Administration because for state agencies, that's who we, and their attorney is, their attorney was one of my first calls. Um, this question perhaps is more for Jan, I'm not sure we'd like to comment on it. I would like you to try to share with us your perspective of where the risks are that you see and what are your plans. I know you've talked some about the enrollment, 
and the concern that if we don't have the necessary enrollment, your thoughts on that. But if you could outline us for us other areas where you see the risks and what kind of plans you put together to deal with that. Um, we, we did look at risk in the early part of this process and then changed and shifted some of those in terms of the management agreement. Obviously, enrollment is a risk, and that's why having a plan in place is how we addressed and expect to deal with that risk. Uh, change of culture. Um, we're used to various cultures, and we support the Crosswinds culture. And we're going to have to, to work um, with great intensity to help maintain what's here. I'm not worried about it, but I, we had listed it as a potential risk. Um, I always watch, and my management team will tell you this, I always watch for staff burnout. We came into this understanding that, the, that it would be fairly flat in management, however, being able to identify the management team here has helped a great deal. Um, there's always a risk that, um, there's a risk that we just go from management agreement to management agreement, that there's always some loss in that process. Uh, there's a risk that Harambe decides to add seven, eight, nine, ten, but we'll work closely with them. Um, other than that, and and I think I would offer any member of the management team because they know I'm I'm a very uh, optimistic person and tend to just charge ahead. So, do any of you have any thoughts on any risk, any other risks? I'm sure some will arise as, as we go into the process. I certainly can comment. If she could comment. I absolutely will. Whenever, Whenever a board um, enters into a contract, and boards are the authorizers of a contract, management is not but management holds the responsibility of doing the due diligence so that when the package is brought to the board, the risks are um, all defined and they're vetted. Um, they are um, processed through a number of angles, um, agencies in, in public entities, through um, our, the people that we report to, which is the Department of Education, um, we have to make sure that every statute is in compliance. We have to make certain that our attorneys have double-checked every word that is in every contract because every word in a contract has meaning. Um, it's um, no word is to be taken um, lightly or out of context. So I think um, with the work that Sherry and I have done throughout this year, um, to do the due diligence as your management team, um, that it has been our responsibility to make sure that there is no rock that has not been unturned and there has been no area unaddressed or questioned. Um, and I think you will have seen in both the Harambe contract and in this contract that's before you today that one looks at liability risks, one looks at financial risks, uh, one looks at reporting risks because if we don't report properly, all of us are at risk. Um, we look at um, uh, clauses of termination, what would cause us to have to separate um, and go each in our own direction and what would the risks be in that particular situation. Um, so we have, we as EMID management, do not have any control over a few items that um, Perfect Center for Arts Education um, would need to respectfully move forward, um, and I think they have identified that for you, is that students are their revenue. Uh, staffing is their expense. Facilities and operations are their expense. Um, what monies are encumbered, someone has to cover their cash flow. 
no differently than someone covers our cash flow with monies that are encumbered. That's why all of you have fund balances in your districts is because you don't get paid every single month by the students that are in your districts. You get paid on a schedule by the Minnesota Department of Education. So we have, we have vetted all of that informa information so that um, we can come to you with a contract that we know that the risks um, have been um, identified. Um, the Minnesota, um, state of Minnesota has also looked at all of the risks and I've identified where they may be at risk and where they may have to, um, in more importantly, cash flow, if that were um, a situation that arose. So um, I would not uh, have brought anything to you that, uh, and nor would Sherry have brought anything to you that we didn't feel was completely vetted by statutory, every statutory requirement I think we've indicated to you before, we've been dealing with multiple statutes through all of these processes, um, it, that um, we would not feel would be a document that you could, that was legally supported. Yeah. And Sherry, if you have anything to add to that, um, yeah. or yeah. you're in alignment, yeah. Right. Yes, that is correct. The state protects its risks immediately through their contracts, and and why you ha and that's why we have good lawyers. But one of the things I forgot to mention that I, I think is important when we were identifying hard and soft risks, part of what we looked at was continuity and governance, not necessarily your governance because that's you're the EMIT board and, and that's your issue, but looking at our board, was there a way to be able to provide for some continuity? And I'm, I'm really pleased that an EMIT family member, Susan Ma Larson, um, applied for and was named, I think about two weeks ago, to the Purpose Center Board of Directors. And that will be helpful for some continuity uh, very, very helpful. And so looking at hard and soft risks um, has been really an important part of our process in the beginning. It was to make certain we were protecting our agency and the tentacles of our agency. I, I feel pretty comfortable that we have done everything possible and I know that EMID has as well. And I want to make one more comment which has been um, voiced uh, quite often, and that is the risk that our 10 member districts feel by losing a person in a seat in one of their classrooms um, when that person would be seated at crosswinds. Uh, that's been of, of concern, and I believe that that's been um, very clearly voiced over more than my lifetime at, at EMIT. Um, and we have talked about that very openly. Um, Perpich draws from the entire state of Minnesota in their current facility. Um, they, would, they may not be drawing from our 10 member districts. They, we may be offered services by Perpich Center for Arts Education with your students in your districts, but they will draw from 31 districts in the metro area if students choose this as their choice. So it's a, a bigger picture than our 10 member districts. However, I, I realize and I, I respect your concern for that. As a K-12 superintendent, I was concerned about everybody that left my school district too for open enrollment or for other purposes. So I think we've, we've, we clearly understand the importance, and uh, we've talked about it a lot, that it's clearly important for students to be within your district. And I appreciate the comments, Lori, that you made the statements tonight about strengthening the partnerships, um, as so many of you have done within your districts to partner with other assets within your communities. Can I follow up on that, uh, that point in particular? I have some other questions, but uh, I'll defer to my colleagues. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on that point in particular. You said that uh, 
Crosswinds will be now drawing from 31 districts? Potentially. I mean, potentially. This, is, this isn't an, an, no, I, a 10 member district EMID. Um, the question I have is would transportation be provided by the state to, to those 31 districts? No. So if outside of the 10 member collaborative, they would have to provide well, their own transportation. I'm going to defer this question to Sherry because I don't, my understanding is that it would not be covered under DSEG dollars. Right, under the, because it's still in um, East Metro Integration District, it's basically management of uh, the Crossman School. Right. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, the only students that would be <coughs> For DSEG transportation are either those that are transported from our member districts right. or those that have been grandfathered in. Okay. Um, yeah, I have some other questions, but I'll defer. But you know, when you have open enrollment students that come from other districts to your school, they're transported by, by that's right, other than by your contractors or your local bus services. And they, I think that's a big difference. Oh, of course it is. Of course it is, Jim. And they, Mr. Chairman, they do get monies to their district line, but that's right. it. Correct. And uh, we overlook the fact that it's a year old school as well. So right. there's another segment of people that either do want that or don't want that right. that enters into the picture. But And I, I just will take one minute again to kind of go back to what Mr. Broderick said. And I understand very clearly that a 200 enrollment would not probably be very good for anyone because class sizes and programs that you can offer. We all know in our districts that if you don't have the bodies, you don't have the programs as well. And to make the comment that you would cut back on some other things, it's still the programs that have to be paid for. And so you do need the bodies. So I'm really, I'm back to my same concern that while I love your ideas and you present them very, very well, and I know how badly the parents want this opportunity, I go back to the fact that um, it's a very expensive school to run, and if you don't have the body, somebody's going to pay for it, and these pots of money that we talk about are everybody, and so that's my main concern. It's not the program, it's not the people, and it's certainly not the parents, but we have a lot of students across the state that we have to consider, and they're all very, very important, so I wouldn't see how a 200 or maybe even 250 could fill this building and still survive. Yeah, and I guess that's a, my follow-up question is um, probably more of a comment than a question. And, and I don't think this, this forum is the appropriate forum to try and figure this out because I think I'd have to sit down and actually go through a spreadsheet and the number, budget numbers and the like. But essentially what you're proposing is to have a school that receives all of the state aids uh, that, that our schools receive, uh, receives no um, levy referendum uh, dollars and you're going to then take those dollars and be able to have class sizes between 10 and 24 and if you're successful I want to take over I want to approach you on uh, taking over the management of South Washington County schools as well I know, this is enough. <laughs> uh, no and I say that uh, you I know because I, I don't see how the numbers work out I mean if if you can uh, not have any referendum revenue and still have class sizes of 10 to 24, that's remarkable. Um, and I, I'm just wondering where, where are we wasting so much money that we need to have referendum dollars just to maintain class sizes between 20 and 27? I think I would prefer that Sharon answer that one. <laughs> I, I, like I say, it will take too long to yeah, try right. and answer that, but it, it, the numbers just seem very uh, difficult for me to believe that they're accurate. Just a couple of questions, and it's kind of, I guess it's more clarification, but if there would be a change of governance in another year through the legislature, then would transportation still be continued the same way? For both Roseville, for going back to the this legislative session, transportation was included in both of the bills that had that were moving through. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so yes. So even if governance was changed to Roseville, 
because it is an integration, inter-district integration magnet. Okay. That is why transportation is. Oh, okay. That's, okay. That, that's what triggers the transportation piece. Okay. Um, the other question has to do with staff. If any of our present staff were to um, be going be a staff member with Perpich, if they are in fact operating and managing the building next year, how what's pay schedule? Um, do they have? Is it unionized? A bargaining unit? Is it? Are there changes there that staff would need to be aware of before accepting a position? I'm going to allow Sue to respond. And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. <coughs> and early on when I was meeting with employees here, I did talk about some of that too, just so you are aware. Recognizing changes. Um, all of the Perpich employees are unionized, um, except for the administrators. Um, and um, the teachers and the administrative staff would be in unions, the same unions that cover the state. Um, and um, I don't, haven't done a comparison of the salary levels, um, but I'm guessing that they're going to be pretty consistent. Um, the, um, the benefits packages will probably be pretty, be pretty similar as well. We would do as much as we can to um, to make sure there's as little um, difficulty on that as we can, but we have we do have our own contracts. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other any other comments or questions? Well, I would tell you that maybe I have progressed from an absolute no to a skeptic. Um, and I'm still skeptical, and I haven't really received a very good answer, and hope a little later that Mr. Celeste can tell us on the, the enrollment project projections and how many people answered that survey, because I think that's of great concern. Um, are the folks that you're intending to hire aware that it's just a one-year contract? Yes. Okay. Because um, I think we need to look at this both in short-term and long-term. And uh, it appears to me that if you are granted this short-term, that you will certainly have some advantages in the long-term. So that's why it's... Um, of great concern to me. Also is concern to me uh, in the future as going to the legislature. Well, let me back up. At the hearing yesterday, it was interesting that the student from out of country said that his family was paying $2,000 for his education and here it was free. Well, that's not really true. <laughs> Because at one time, when we had the highest level of funding, we were very comparable to some private schools. And so, as you tell us that you can come up with a hundred thousand dollars to the good, I'm I share the skepticism of some of my other board members. We have uh, taken out of our fund balance this year more than a million dollars, and so after making some significant cuts. So, uh, you know, you're gonna have to struggle with that, but I'm skeptical about it. And I think you need to know that. My other concern is if this should go into a long-term arrangement, then I think there are some things in the bills that were presented at the legislature this year that really didn't deal very well with open enrollment. Uh, there are things that are still in that bill about uh, equal number of students from the con congressional districts, and that would not apply to this facility, although the way it's written, that, uh, that's not eliminated. Um, you have a selection process for students that come to you at the Perpich Center. Uh, that is in opposition of open enrollment. And none of those bills have anything in them, not even the word integration. 
And those are concerns that, that I would raise at this time because I, if, if this facility is to be transferred, those are things that need to be dealt with. And I would hope that the, that the future bills would be much more explicit and that the Perpich Center and the Crosswinds would be more uh, separated than they currently have been. Any other comments or questions? I've got one that a yes, no would be preferable. In the income contract, uh, it states that you will assume responsibility for providing for the educational program and operation of Crosswinds as a year-round arts-focused magnet school encompassing voluntary integration for middle school students. Are you committed to that long term? Absolutely. And my second one relates to a statement in the income contract as well. And I would like you to expand on this line a little bit if you can. Work with Minnesota institutions of higher education to develop a model integration arts magnet school for teaching teachers and implementing best practices for student and teacher achievement. I really appreciate that question because it's been um, not only with this initiative but with others uh, a priority of our organization that part of what we saw in value for Crosswinds was the ability to take a school that really had some great success in integration both ethnic, programmatic, all aspects of integration and teach teachers how to teach, how to go out in schools and teach better. And so part of what we had, what we will do, and we've spoken to some of the state universities um, already about this, is provide this as a model for student teaching and also for training of current teachers to come in and learn and be supervised, but learn how to take this wonderful model of education and then when they go into their other school districts or around the state, they take it with them. That it, it's somewhat of a, a dual purpose, um, dual staffed organization of student and teacher training, as well as using the school as a, a laboratory, a laboratory school. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, thanks for uh, being on the uh, chair, I guess, uh, and answering our questions. Uh, hopefully, board members got what you needed um, with questions and comments. Um, thanks to all of you for uh, coming out, and we're going to move forward with our learning session, our work session at this time. Um, the next item on our work session is a discussion of extending the closing of Crosswinds Arts and Science school to the end of the 2013-14 school year. I'm going to turn that over to the superintendent to explain what that's all about. No, this is a, we're in a work session. I just want, yes, and I put this on the work session item so that you, it was very clear um, about the resolutions that you will be um, electing to vote on in your board packet. And the first resolution that you will be asked to, um, to consider is one where you're extending the closing of the school to the end of the 13-14 school year versus the 12-13 school year. And it's contingent upon approval of the income contract that you have before you. I just wanted to make sure that there were no questions about why it was stated the way it is in that first resolution. You don't open a building for one more year without an occupant is basically the bottom line and the recommendation from our legal counsel. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear and understood that. Uh, we'll move to uh, item number four then, a discussion of the State of Minnesota income contract between Purpose Center for Arts Education 
and EMID 6067. I presume that's uh, clarification type questions. If board members have anything for the superintendent on that. I think Sherry spent most of her day today on the phone making certain that everything was tweaked um, according to any recommendation that the state had for um, items and there were minor modifications and it just where statutes needed to be cited um, primarily in more than one particular um, area within the contract. Um, so I think um, the contract that you have before you, which is the board packet that was at your place, has the current contract with all of the minor, very minor modifications that were asked for by the Minnesota Management and Budget Division of Finance. Um, so I, um, you've read the contract that was in your board packet, just wanting to make sure that you don't have any further questions about what you've read um, and would want anything further clarified before we move into the board session. Uh, the question I have is, in what ways is this contract different than the contract that we entered into with Roseville, other than the partners? There are very little differences yeah. um, as far as Roseville. The way the funding mechanism is set up is the same. Mm -hmm. From a financial uh, perspective, the different any differences that are there are there as a requirement of the, the state structure or the state template. But as far as the basic, um, the basic uh, points, the criteria that's required by Minnesota Management and Budget, that's all all the same. The um, information that our attorney has uh, recommended uh, for the protection from a liability standpoint, from an operational standpoint, um, as far as email goes, um, it is the same. Uh, we have many, in many areas, the language is identical. Um, we've actually taken language from Roseville's contract and put it into this contract um, uh, to meet the requirements of Minnesota Management Budget. Mm -hmm. Are there any places in this contract that would cost EMIT money no. that are not in the, in the Roseville contract? No. Yeah. So the uh, maintenance of the building, the upkeep of the building, um, all of that is identical. Correct. The financial, uh, the foundation um, the, from a financial perspective is identical. The liability causes me some concern, and I assume that's apparent uh, in both uh, contracts, but especially as it relates to our special education population. Um, if they do not get appropriate services under the 94-142 federal law, uh, those parents have the ability to sue. I assume they would be suing EMID and not Perpich. No, that is not correct. That is not correct. We are both required to carry liability insurance, and while we cannot prohibit, we can't prohibit anyone from suing us, um, under either contract, or in many right. respects, as you know, as a board member, um, we, while we may not be able to prohibit it, it doesn't necessarily mean they would prevail, but we, we would carry liability um, insurance as an organization, and um, Herbich is required to um, carry um, insurance as well. Mm -hmm. But does the contract specify that Herbich is the first uh, source of no, it does not in, in either contract. No. It doesn't say that they're the first source, and I don't know that that would uphold in court anyway, mm -hmm. I, is it what I believe our attorney would tell us. No, monitoring and compliance would be done uh, under the Minnesota Department of Education uh, specifications. Uh, people that provide the services to the students would be held accountable for um, the following through with the individual educational plan as written by the team. Um, there will need to be a special education director that would provide oversight, um, which would need, could be a contract service, but it would need to be providing oversight to the special education program that would be offered in this facility. And if a parent comes back and has someone who moved out of Crosswinds, went through the Crosswinds program for the next year, and comes back the following year and says, my son did not receive or my daughter did not receive uh, the services that they were specified in the IEP, 
um, it would be Purpich then that would be responsible for providing yeah. and they were bailed in their Right, and there process. would be potentially uh, compensatory time that would be offered uh, and paid for by Purpich um, to provide where any um, perceived gaps or faults um, would have been identified um, where there needs to be some resolution through nego the unnegotiated process. It would not necessarily move to a court hearing. It right. most likely is, ne is yeah. negotiated. Due process. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Kitty? Um, I th I'll try speaking loudly. I, I understand that we're still going to have, EMID would still have some offices here and some space here. Mm -hmm. Is that specified in contract? Um, the, the amount of space and the agreement on that? No. The, what's in the contract is running the educational program for students in this facility. So will even... Will we'll be the, paying for space? Is that what you're asking? No. In the Harambe contract, we specified that the superintendent office would maintain in the Harambe building and space would be given for that purpose. Um, I. I we don't have it in there. You are correct. Right. And that was the concern to me because I thought we wanted to continue to have some space here we in do. this facility. Yes. Well, that has been, I don't know why Sue went, that we have had multiple discussions about that. We did not include that in the contract. So would it be, be then billed back? No. Because they're paying a monthly fee for the space? Would the we facility? be billed back? Would e EMID be billed for facility use because one of their ways of bringing in form or revenue was um, facility, uh, facility revenue. 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 We would need, we, we don't intend to pay for space. We intend to negotiate that as use within this facility, the small amount of space that we need, and partner with Purpich on professional development that we would need to be providing for our member districts. Why is there so much? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, they're asking about the space that we would be um, encroaching upon um, at Crosswinds. Uh, we have talked about that and that we would be welcomed to have offices here. We did talk about that. The question would be then why wasn't it in the contract? Could I add something? Sherry, go ahead. Yep. Um, the reason that it was not in this contract is, in fact, Harambe is at capacity. So I think the concern was that it was specifically superintendent's office for the superintendent, because that is where the superintendent is currently office, that there be some space allowed there. Um, and in fact, you know, as the discussion has carried forward tonight, it is a one-year contract. It is mm -hmm. only for the 13-14 school year. And as much um, as perfect and probably all of, in this, all of us in this room would like for it to happen, this building will not be at capacity next year. Um, so, and, so that is the simple reason it, is it wasn't a priority as it was in the case of Harambe for the superintendent to have an office there right. for the and, upcoming year. And Kitty, we also have an agreement that if the space really becomes crowded at Harambe, then uh, that office would have to be given up. And I, uh, if, if it were, me that was officing out of there for a few hours a month, then I would need to move where there would be more space so that could be used for a different purpose. So that still is subject to negotiation, but uh, it was put in the contract so that there would be a spot close to MDE where I could um, at least have a meeting if I needed one. Any others? Do you have a question? Just a um, thought in coming through it, because when you said it's similar with the financial business, I go back again that the state, and I imagine the state is the perfect school guidance when we talk about the state. That's what we're talking about. Yes. That the situation, again, as you mentioned, is Harambe is full and will remain full and is in the district, and but it's quite a different story here. And so as I read this again, that if the monies aren't there, if the students aren't there that we all hope for, that the state is the one that would have to pick up from these little pots of money um, the expense, not even. But again, it would be an expense to the state. Yeah. We Correct. are not picking up any expenses right. or any lack of revenue that Perpich uh, may um, encounter because of 
the lack of revenue due to um, a lesser student enrollment mm -hmm. than they anticipated. We just read from this that the state would be on the hook for that. And the state means purpose. And the, yeah, yeah. The all, okay. which means the state. They're like, give the same. Any other comments, questions? Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn the work session? So, so move and a second, Amy. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, we're gonna take a five minute recess before we begin our board meeting.
If we can get everybody to return to their seats, uh, we'll start the regular board meeting. to approve the agenda for this evening. So moved. So move over here and so second over there. All right, thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Thank you, the agenda is approved. Uh, we'll go to open forum. Uh, first speaker, Eric Celeste. Hello, my name is Eric Celeste. I'm the parent of a 10th grader, and as such, no direct um, dog in this fight in that my son will be moving on in any case this year. But I've been at this a long time. You all know who I am. And one of the things I wanted to point out was that in 2011, I brought a petition to you as you were considering the closure of Harambe and Crosswinds. And in that petition, we had gathered 190 or so signatures supporting both Harambe and Crosswinds. Um, earlier this, this um, week, I shared a petition with you in email, and I just put copies in front of you that had the details of something we did this year, um, just in the last few weeks, and we gathered 269 signatures for Crosswinds alone. Um, in 2011, we said that we wanted to sign on as partners with you in running this school and Harambe and finding a sustainable way to manage them. Enthusiasm for these schools has grown, as this petition demonstrates, not slacked. Even though you see different enrollment numbers, be clear that there is enthusiasm for these schools. And it is more than just what you see in this room today. Um, two highlights. Uh, about the, the survey. Um, one, uh, and I can answer questions about this further if you like, we asked parents, uh, we asked families who had a student in Crosswinds who could be here next year, in other words, I couldn't answer this question, but students who were six to nine, um, whether they were interested in continuing next year if Perpich were managing the school. That's where the 87% figure comes from. Um, Marilyn uh, Forsberg had asked what that represents, that was 46 respondents to that section of the survey. Um, overall, um, we had, uh, you know, uh, I'd say, well more than 15 or 20 percent of the community responded, which is a pretty significant response to a, a survey and petition. These 46 represent about 15 percent of folks who would qualify to answer this question, maybe a little bit more than that. So. You can take some solace from that, that yes, there's a very keen interest in continuing at Crosswinds. Um, another thing to notice is that um, all, I, I, I neglected to put one number on the Plan B alternatives, and that was the number of people who were not sure, who hadn't made a Plan B. Um, that number was only four of those who responded to that section, said that they had, were not sure what they were going to do. In other words, Families have made alternative plans, but even given that, they are most enthusiastic about Plan A, staying at Crosswinds. Um, families know this won't be easy. We understand that Crosswinds is, in a sense, rebooting 
and starting from scratch, but we have a long enough memory to know that Crosswinds has done this before, and we believe it can do this again. It started much smaller than 200, in fact, um, so I don't think the 200 number is a terrible uh, tragedy, but we think we'll be stronger than that next year, as Ms. Mackert mentioned. We want to be partners with Perpich in the future of this school, and we want to be partners with EMID and what unfolds here. Since 2011, this board has consistently acted to support the Crosswind program, and I appreciate that, and we recognize that. In 2011, you voted to keep it open, and just in January, you voted to continue the program. Um, and I recently got some sense of how difficult that support has been for you. I attended the St. Paul Public School Board uh, Committee of the Board meeting with watch John Broderick in action, uh, explaining the situation here to people who didn't have uh, nearly the immersion you all have had in the situation. And the situation saw multiple misunderstandings of what is transpiring here, including a misunderstanding about the consistency of your position. There, the sense was, well, you voted to close the schools in January, why not just leave it closed? We all know that in January, that vote to close the schools was only part of what happened at that meeting, but that was hand in hand with a vote to continue the program, and it was necessary in order to hand over governance in the way you were planning in January. The consistent message of this board has been, if we can save the program, let's save the program, and we appreciate everybody who has helped to do that. And we just want to continue that. I just saw Myron Orfield present here uh, yesterday at the Education Policy Committee um, hearing, and it was powerful to listen to him describe the resegregation of the Twin Cities and that diversity that we're experiencing in Minnesota does not necessarily equate to integration and a knowledge of one another's strengths and a respect for one another. That in fact, in much of the metro, the opposite is happening. We have something special here at Crossroads. We have a program that can teach the state how to work together in this diverse future. Let us grow that together. If you vote to allow Perpich management of this program for the next year, I believe you'll see something remarkable <coughs> emerge here and you'll be part of something remarkable. And we all are ready to partner with Perpich and with you to make that happen, just as we were in 2011. You've seen us get stronger since then. We plan to get stronger in the next year. This isn't the end of the story if you help us tell it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn Stein. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Stein. I'm a mom of three EMID kids in fourth, sixth, and tenth grades. And tonight I'm asking the board to please let families have the decision to send our kids to crosswinds into the future, managed under Perpich. I'm confident that Perpich will build crosswinds attendance and staff up again, and the school will be a great success. I'm very excited and look forward to this partnership with Perpich to help continue the Crosswinds tradition <coughs> of being an excellent choice for children to learn about traditional school subjects like math, science, and reading, and also um, integration, arts, and building community. I very much appreciate being given the opportunity to make this choice. Choice is the reason that so many of us are here in the first place, and we really want to continue having that choice. Um, for our kids and for our families. I'm very confident that Perpich will do an amazing job building the school up and making it live up to all its potential. The synchronicity between Harambe, Crosswinds, and Perpich is really palpable to me. Perpich weaves integration in naturally through its emphasis on the arts and helping kids to not only discover their gifts and talents, but to hone in on how they can best serve the world and their community after high school. That's why EMID and Perpich are such a logical and beneficial partnership. It's my hope that my kids will have, and all kids, will have the chance to choose an integrated arts-focused education like this. So I'm asking you to please vote to continue the Crosswinds legacy by allowing Perpich to manage Crosswinds. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Bev Danielson Selling. Good evening. 
but I really feel like just saying is ditto to that. Uh, my name is Bev Danielson Sully, parent of one alum, who's very involved here, Xander, and a current eighth grader of Crosswinds. I'm here now, as I've always been, a very strong supporter of the agreement between Perkich and Crosswinds. Even though we were all encouraged to have a plan B school in place for our kids, my soon-to-be ninth grader, I've never given up on the hope for Crosswinds to survive. That has been my vision all along and continues to be. And I pray that you will all agree that the partnership between Perpich and Crosswinds is a good fit, a win-win for everyone. It's a partnership that also makes sense and you voted that way earlier this year. I, along with many other committed parents, are more than willing to help with the marketing and recruitment and whatever it takes to help make this happen for this coming year. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Holly Ingersoll. Good evening. I'm Holly Ingersoll, and I have a sixth grader at Crosswinds who this year. Um, you've seen me before. Um, I really listened to the presentation by Perpich tonight. Um, I had not heard the plan. Um, I listened quite critically because I do have a sixth grader um, with special needs who has been served very well by Crosswinds. Um, in fact, I think I may have told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again because I'm so proud of him. Um, he's actually quite a very compliant child. I have a very easy job as a parent, but um, for the first time in his life that I've seen, he said, Mom, if Crosswind stays open, I'm going there. And I have never, ever seen him adamantly speak his mind before. And I thought, wow, I really need to do whatever it takes to make sure that this happens for him. Um, so when I listened to Sue and the others talk about Perpich, there were a few things that really um, stood out for me that made me feel that a partnership between Emid and Perpich and us makes sense. Um, a few of those things were the 13,000 um, professionals that they have already provided outreach to throughout the state and their regional centers. Um, when they talked about, when Sue talked about this kind of East Metro district almost being a regional center, that's at least what I got out of it. That felt really good to me. Um, the understanding, the partnerships they already have and the desire to partner with all of us. Uh, the diversity versus integration that was actually on the slide um, caught my eye and really made me, um, gave me hope that they know the difference. And when I came to the hearing, the legislative hearing yesterday and took the day off work, um, I took my lunch into the lunchroom with the children and I was struck again by the first time I walked into the building and saw the children sitting at round tables, all races sitting together. Um, when I, you know, when I've walked into schools, when I grew up in school, but even my son's schools, there is, there can be diversity and segregation within that diversity. And that's what I see in other, many other places, not all, but many. And I was struck um, having lunch with these children, they, we were all together, and it was it was uh, the difference between diversity and integration. I feel like Perpich gets that, and that's important to me. Um, bringing in professional development for new teachers to preserve the culture that you have created, that made it safe for my child, means the world to me. I believe them. I believe that they will try to do that. I believe that they will succeed at that. I hope they will succeed at that because that is what I think has helped my child to blossom this year. I also, the art science piece, I'll let it go, but that's really cool. 
um, that they want to maybe look at that here because we're an arts and science school. But I wanted to also speak for the woman who is sitting next to me. Her name is Brenda Middleton, and I met her at West Side Story. And we just happened to talk. Um, and she told me that I could speak for her tonight because she had to leave. She also has a sixth grader, and she had to leave um, to go back to the homeless shelter that they're staying at. And in sixth grade, she being a sixth grader, um, her daughter, this has been the most stable place, despite all this madness um, and chaos that it feels like to us, um, this has been the most stable place for her daughter. Her daughter went from, I wrote on my hand, it's a pill and stuff, B's, C's, D's, and F's in her previous school, and lots and lots of bullying. Um, and here she has almost completed her first full year, and she told me with a glowing face that she's getting A's and B's and did get one C. Um, they were very clear with me that they wanted me to tell you that they would like to see Crosswinds continue under Perpetch, and clearly they were willing to do what they could to support that effort as much as it took to do that. And I promise that, and we've, I think those of us who've had some more flexibility have tried to be the voice, even though you keep seeing us over and over again, and it's like, oh, the same old 25 people or 20 people or eight people. We actually do represent other people when we come to these meetings, and it's, sometimes it's the people who can't be here. Um, and I think that that's all I want to say. I just really would encourage you to let Crosswinds continue. Um, let it be a model for the state. Let the learnings be spread. And um, I think we can do it. I heard Crosswind started with 40 students. So I'm like, we can do this. And I personally am totally committed um, to making sure that it is successful and doing whatever it takes to help you and Perpich to see that happen. So I was at the legislature. I've been here. I'll, be, I'll keep being there. I'll be there for the good stuff. <laughs> So, thanks. Thank you. Thomas Bogoshevsky. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thomas Bogoshevsky. I am an alumnus of uh, Crosswinds, uh, six years out. And I have a younger sister who goes here still. And I was a guest teacher here in May. Um, so I'm going to begin by saying thank you very much. Today uh, is a pretty good day for everybody here. Um, because thanks to the diligence of Janet Moore and Sherry and uh, all of the Enid families and Sumacher and the people from Perpich and the board, the concerns and questions that some of you may have had about <clears throat> uh, towards Perpich's, the Perpich Center's plan uh, for crosswinds have finally been laid to rest without a reasonable doubt. And we've cleared up the curriculum questions, we've cleared up the faculty questions, we've cooled up the uh, the enrollment questions, the integration questions, the collaborative questions, contract questions, and so on, and everything satisfies. And it's true that it's going to be a lot of work for us, but hard work is never hard when you know exactly what you're going to do, and now we all know exactly what we're going to do. Where there was once fear and doubt, and just to some of you, there is now clarity, beautiful clarity, and the one best choice is laid out in front of you. All the logistics and numbers have been laid out, leaving no room for uncertainty. Now you can act with your hearts and your brains and the stories and the numbers and your self-interest and the best interest of the community all unified, wrapped up in one. There is no cognitive dissonance or conflict anymore between us. No more misunderstandings. A partnership between Emid and Perpich, ensuring the survival of Crosswinds is what every family needs and what every kid needs and what you need as well. Voting in favor of Perpich's contract is going to lift the weight that has been bearing down 
on your shoulders and our shoulders <clears throat> for a very long time and it's going to move us forward. Uh, by making, you know, it's, it's a decision to, you know, part the clouds and let the sun come through. And when it does that, it's going to shine on all of us equally. It's not going to, you know, shine on one person and on another one. We're partners and we're going to do this together. Thank you. Uh, Anna Parker. to thank you all for allowing the issues and the conflicts to rest in peace. And no, John, you're not going to be pushing up daisies. This, this, this means... I thought you were putting it on my chest. Yeah. <laughs> I was when I brought these in. <laughs> but these are ox-eye daisies. And from our restored prairie here, I've been here since before the building was, and I was working with the Wilder Foundation, being a tree care advisor and a master gardener there. And tonight is all about growth, and it's all about fresh beginnings. And so from our prairie to you, this represents a visual living nature as art um, metaphor because I'm a language arts teacher and I've been, these are joined together, Marilyn. <laughs> 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 I appreciate the daisies, but I'm not too impressed with those Canadian thistles in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why I'm working with the Department of Natural Resources and we have a management plan, yes? And it, and it takes partnerships and it takes outside collaboration. And, there you go. There's, there's one for each. The other flower in here is a daisy flea bane. And it was, it was used to, to banish any, any irritant that, that pioneers' dogs might have had or any animals as they were being taken care of. And, and Jim, you have helped to banish any fears and hesitancies um, the, the headlines of the paper, if we can show the Woodbury Bulletin, and I'm a taxpayer here in Woodbury, and I've lived here for the past 10 years. Not only is, is Woodbury soaking in summer's arrival, but Crosswinds is at a crossroads, and the district folds its hands. And so as we continue on, to create a win-win situation. As a mother of twins, I appreciate the diversity of everybody putting their hands together. And I really want crosswinds to be managed by Purpich. But personally, I have always worked for the common good. I coordinated Project Common Ground at Wilder Forest when I lived there with my twin daughters for six and a half years. And I have been an integrationist for the past 17 years, since before this building was here. The dream was here. And I've addressed you and the dream of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. We need tonight to continue on, fresh as daisies, all of the banes of the existence that have bothered us can, can end tonight. And we can go on together in partnership using the Crosswinds model that we have worked so hard to develop, partnering with the University of Minnesota with their Terry program, teacher effectiveness redesign initiative, teacher education redesign initiative. We've got student teachers here now. We've been doing that partnership with the Bush Foundation. We're in the third of five years. Plans with the university um, we can use this as a statewide model, just like Master Gardeners. We can do it for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you.
Terry Dixon.
please allow Herbridge to run crosswinds next year. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Zaman. Community Cultures and Environmental Science Elementary School, there was one name, in 1996, there was intentional action to have it serve as not only a magnet school, but a lab school as well. An environment where new and innovative theories and methods could be applied. At that time, lessons learned were to be shared with the three districts so that they could be used to benefit all students and teachers in those member districts. I don't know what happened to this lab school concept. Along the way, to me it seems like it is definitely gone. All of Minnesota is growing more and more racially diverse. Of course, integration is about more than race alone. It also includes socioeconomic status, and every community faces challenges with poverty and homelessness. Integration also includes people with a wide range of physical as well as learning disabilities. Of course, these are matters that all communities face as well. My point is this. It is our duty as adults to prepare all students for life as global citizens. It is crucial that they have the interpersonal skills and cultural competency to interact successfully with whoever they may encounter. Perpich knows how to deliver this valuable information and training to the entire state of Minnesota. Studies show that all members of a society benefit from intentional and purposeful integration. To me, it seems like everybody wins. You, as a board, have the opportunity to put the wheels in motion for the good of all of us. I also I would confirm with Brian, but uh, I also know that there are currently 29 applications in the office for students that want to attend this fall. They know, they know we're scheduled to close three weeks from today, but they want to come here. I've also met many families that have just learned about Crosswinds because of all of the legislative activity and the press coverage. And they've said, I didn't know this was here. I want my kids to have a chance to pick that if it works for them. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Susan Larson. Good evening. Um, my name is Susan Larson. I have addressed you many times, I believe, as a Crossman's parent. Tonight, I speak to you in a different capacity. I speak to you as a member of the Purpose Center for the Arts Board of Directors. Um, I was very humbled a couple weeks ago when I received this appointment from the governor's office. And I believe it will be really a privilege to serve the state of Minnesota and represent the 40th Congressional District in this capacity. I accept this opportunity because I believe so strongly in the mission of Courage and in teaching in and through the arts. I have observed firsthand, not only through my son, but through many, through many kids, how the arts can really unlock what is inside them, help them become really the best person that they can be, and help them learn to understand others and to work with others in a very diverse and integrated environment. I believe that Purpose will play a very strong and effective role in managing crosswinds, and I just want to tell you 
that my commitment to you as a member on the Perpich Board is to help in that process, to help ensure that there is continuity, to help ensure that we maintain the culture that has been so effective in Crossroads, and to make this a successful partnership. So I really look forward to serving in that capacity. As Sue Mackard mentioned, the possibility of the two boards coming together for a session, and I look forward to working with all of you in that session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Tammy Bain Kuzmarski. Good evening, board members. I thank you for taking the time um, as appointed board members to really look at all aspects of crosswinds and the integration legislation from which it came from. Um, which Crosswinds and Harambe as a result were established. Um, listening to questions that you had for Sue, you <coughs> talked about expenses. Keep in mind, the school doesn't have sports. We don't have sports teams, so we don't have those expenses. Um, also, Crosswinds um, could pull from one of St. Paul's schools that has year-round service, and that might make it attractive as well. They do go through sixth grade. Um, also, please keep in mind that the trees have already been planted, carefully nurtured, and deeply rooted for a successful integration-based school. And that's near and dear to my heart based on my past experiences that you guys have probably already heard about. Proof that the school was on track was shown when it was expanded to ninth and 10th grade curriculum. Please keep that in mind. Momentum was built to expand the model um, to 11th and 12th grade. We all ask why the momentum was truly stopped and why two years later we are also struggling to hand the program over to an agency that has the vision to sustain and take this program to further heights. In reference to the show The Million Dollar Man, Purpich is the Rudy able to carry us on to a bigger, better bionic integration-based middle school. The current Crosswind staff, I feel confident, are vested enough in the successful curriculum that they have established um, to make sure it's carried on if they're unable to return, if Perpich is granted management. Um, they, I'm sure, would share their best practices. And just for the record, my daughter, Megan Kazmarski, is a 10th grader here and she will, it has been enrolled at Creative Arts High School. So she will be going to her member district at the end of 10th grade. I also have a 12th grader that has been going to another district for the last two years, just based on school choice and we're on the busing line, so that's what worked. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Representative Joanne Ward. Thank you, board members and uh, superintendent of the district. I, on some levels, I, I really want to apologize for what happened during the legislative session because, I, I, as I've mentioned before at the previous board meeting, I know that you, in, uh, in good faith and trust, made your decision in January, and the legislature was not able to follow through with that. I want to assure you that after your meeting tonight, after you, after you make your decision, um, there are several of us who are planning a legislative session where we will invite all of the legislators, but some in particular, to meet with Perpich and to hear the plan and to go through our hearing process and to have all the legislators have their questions answered in the fall before legislation, the, the session starts. Because when the session starts, they're going to have a lot of other things on their minds, and which is part of what happened last time. We want to be able to get this done and follow through with your plans and expectations in a way that's timely and efficient. Uh, I thank
thank you for all your hard work. I, I know that this has been a very, very difficult time, uh, a long time for some of you. I also believe that the conversation has improved what we will have as an outcome. We've thought more, we've asked questions more, we've challenged each other. And in that process of learning and, and helping each other, and being, I talked with a couple of you earlier, what I call critical friends, we're going to have, we're going to move better forward with confidence and with very good outcomes for the students, the staff, all of the districts involved. <coughs> I just want to say thank you, and uh, I will help you in any way that I can. Thank you. Um, our final speaker, uh, Bill Dressler. My name is Bill Dressler. I have a son at each of the two schools. We all know each other at some level after all these years now. Um, some of this you've heard before, but an educator told me sometimes you have to repeat things at least three times before it sinks in. So I want to thank the board, though, for your due diligence on all these issues over the last two years. It's given me an opportunity to learn and know more about school finances, school law, integration law than I ever thought I would. I also want to thank the staff and the administration and all the parents and the legislators for their support and time that they put into this over the last two years. And I'm going to assume, since Representative Isaacson isn't here tonight, he's now a proud father. <laughs> so, to the script now. So, from my perspective, you stand on the edge of history. And it's been said that history takes seconds to make and years to understand the effects. I trust that you understand the gravity of the situation and the decision before you tonight. But this is not like closing just any school. This school is created after a lawsuit for very specific, very special reasons. The school was started to further and to protect rights guaranteed in our state constitution, which is unlike, as far as I know, almost any other state constitution. These issues are in the constitution. They've been litigated. These are rights that many are willing to litigate again to protect if need be. That's a risk of not proceeding with the question before you tonight. Nobody's brought that up yet. You can rationalize your vote either way, but know that the region, the legislature, the state, and the nation, I guess bet you guys never guessed you'd be part of a discussion on a national blog, would you? We didn't. <laughs> But know that they're all watching, as Carrie talked about. And know that history will judge you, and you will be remembered for what you create tonight or for what you destroy. So fundamentally, when this is all boiled down to the ultimate question, I think it's fairly simple. And I think it is, as Ms. Swanson pointed out earlier, you can be creators with purpose, or you can be destroyers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, action items um, on the agenda. Uh, the first is the approval of opening Crosswind School for the 2013-14 school year. Superintendent, you wish to make any comments? Um, you will see before you that the Board of Education passed a resolution on January 23rd closing the Crosswinds Arts and Science School effective at the end of the 13-14 school year. The board passed this resolution anticipating that Enid would be able to convey Crosswinds Arts and Science School to Purpose Center for Arts Education at the end of the 2012-13 school year. Since legislative action was not taken to authorize the conveyance, the board will need to extend the closing date for Crosswinds Arts and Science School to the end of the 13-14 school year to allow Emmett and Perpich Center for Arts Education to enter into the State of Minnesota income contract 
for the operation of Crosswinds Arts and Science School for the 13-14 school year. This resolution to extend the closing date for Crosswinds is contingent on the adoption of the resolution approving the State of Minnesota income contract, full execution of the income contract, and approval of the State of Minnesota for operation of Crosswinds Arts and Science School by Perfect Center for Arts Education. That is the background and the purpose for this particular resolution. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read the resolution. Uh, I'll make the motion. Uh, look for a second and then we can discuss um, at that point. <coughs> Resolution amending the resolution closing Crosswinds Arts and Science School. Whereas the board passed a resolution on January 23rd, 2013, closing Crosswinds Arts and Science School effective at the end of the 2012-13 school year. Whereas the board passed this resolution anticipating that it would be able to convey Crosswinds Arts and Science School to the Purpose Center for Arts Education effective at the end of the 2012-13 school year. Whereas the 2013 Minnesota Legislature did not authorize that conveyance of the property, and whereas the board finds it to be prudent and in the best interests of the students and community to extend the date for closing Crosswind Arts and Science School to the end of the 2013-14 school year, now therefore be it resolved by the Board of the East Metro Integration District 6067 as follows. Item three of the January 23rd, 2013 resolution closing Crosswinds Arts and Science School is hereby amended to read as follows. Crosswinds Arts and Science School is closed effective at the end of the 2013-14 school year and I'll make that motion and look for a second. Second. Second was Kitty. Okay. Uh, discussion. George, a question I have. Um, if the school were to close this year, and there I'll tell you what, let's do this. Thank you. If the school were to close this year, and there was no occupant, I would assume we talked about this in January, it'd have to be mothballed. Has anybody looked at the cost of mothballing the school? Uh, the answer to that is Cindy is yes. It has been um, very definitely looked at, analyzed very critically. The um, cost would be approximately $300,000 to operate this building with the heat, lights, and two um, maintenance um, employees. Any other comments, questions? Okay, Mary, a roll call vote on this, I guess. <laughs> Yes. Karen Moorhead? No. Jim Galvin? No. George Heppner? Yes. Uh, numbers? A seven to three. Um, by a seven to three vote, um, we have moved for the Extending the closing date to the end of the 2013-14 school year. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of um, State of Minnesota income contract with Perpich Center for Arts Education for the 2013-14 school year. Superintendent, you want to speak to that one? No? <coughs> Thank you. 
Today, July 10th, 2013, the EMIT board, in a separate resolution, which you just heard, extended the date for closing the Crosswinds Arts and Science School to the end of the 13-14 school year contingent on the approval of the State of Minnesota income contract between EMIT and the Perfect Center for Arts Education. EMIT and Perfect Center for Arts Education Administration have negotiated the terms of the income contract by which Perfect will operate on behalf of EMIT the Crosswinds Arts and Science School for the 13-14 school year as an interdistrict integration school. The State of Minnesota Income Agreement has been included in the board packet, which you have read and have had the opportunity now to discuss. Thank you. Uh, as we did with the previous, I'll uh, read the resolution, look for a second, and then any discussion at that point. A resolution approving the State of Minnesota Income Contract for Crosswinds Arts and Science School. Whereas the board passed a resolution on January 23rd, 2013, closing Crosswinds Arts and Science School effective at the end of the 2012-13 school year. Whereas the board passed the January 23rd, 2013 resolution anticipating that it would be able to convey Crosswinds Arts and Science School to the Perfect Center for Arts Education, effective at the end of the 2012-13 school year, whereas the 2013 Minnesota Legislature did not authorize conveyance of the property, whereas staff of EMIT and the Perfect Center for Arts Education have negotiated the terms of an income contract by which Perfect Center for Arts Education will operate on behalf of EMIT the Crosswinds Arts and Science School for the 2013-14 school year as an interdistrict integration school, and whereas the board has by separate resolution extended the date for closing of the Crosswind Arts and Science School to the end of the 2013-14 school year to allow for consummation of the State of Minnesota income contract, now therefore be it resolved by the board of the East Metro Integration District 6067 as follows. One, the State of Minnesota income contract attached here to as Exhibit A is hereby approved subject to full execution of the income contract. And two, the board chair and superintendent are authorized and directed to execute the income contract on behalf of EMID. And I'll move that resolution. Look for a second. Uh, Amy? Amy, second to that? Uh, discussion, comments, questions. Uh, thank you. Um, this evening and for many months now, we've heard and we've all learned um, from Perpich, from our parent community, and uh, I have been, um, this has been an opportunity for learning, and this is how I've chosen to really approach this subject. Um, I'm going into this um, with my intention to support the resolution, and I'd like to just briefly explain why. Uh, I'm going into this, first of all, I'm on one side with reservations, again, wearing my white bear board hat, representing my community and uh, the interest in our board and our administration to retain our students, as someone said this evening, the bottom line is students equal revenue and we're able to do our programs, whether it's at EMID or it's any of our individual districts uh, because of revenue, whether it's the state revenue or it is local levy, we appreciate every dollar that comes to our school district. So I go into this with reservations on the uncertainty of um, Perpich's ability to um, have, have the enrollment to support the programs with the revenue. I lose sleep over our local budget each year to think that when we're setting our budget in White Bear, knowing that our taxpayers and our stakeholders are entrusting us with tens of millions of dollars every year. So I take this very, very seriously and I wish Perpich all the, the great fortune in the world. But I do have the reservations about the dollars, the enrollment, and quite frankly, and I'm being very honest here, the marketing and the recruitment. And I have a great respect for Perpich. 
but uh, I can't, I, I'm being very honest that, that um, our students attending Perpich is, will be seen as, as losing students by some. However, the positive side of this, not just wearing my white bear hat, is I'm seeing this as an opportunity. Perpich in uh, our Northeast metro area is an opportunity to extend another partnership with a very highly regarded organization. And I do believe that our school district, the White Bear School District, is going to benefit from this partnership if the partnership is active. And I would expect that to hold true with Perpich, and I intend to lead that charge for our White Bear School District. As someone said earlier, we've lost the idea of a lab school, and I believe that to be true at Eman. I, I never heard the term lab school until I was on this board, and, and I know I'm not in the buildings daily, but I've not seen examples of lab school. I don't want that to happen with the partnership with Perpich. I want this to be an active partnership and have our students benefit directly from a growing partnership, not just with professional development, but any opportunities for experiential learning for our students. So I'm approaching this, and I'm going to have to go back to my district and explain this, but I, I can only see this as an opportunity because if I were to look at it just from White Bear, I have to look at it from a losing kids standpoint. I'm here because my board appointed me to this board, and I'm responsible for more than the 8,000 plus students in White Bear who stay in White Bear, but our students who choose to attend Crosswinds as well. I care about your students and my students as well. So um, again, I'm, I'm approaching this as an opportunity and I just have great uh, hope for this new, very active partnership. Thank you. I came tonight and I'm sure many of you thought I would not have voted the way I did on the last resolution. I even got a phone call to remind me to be open-minded uh, when I came to this. Um, I've been open-minded the entire time. I, like Lori, have learned through the entire process. I believe the rules have changed. I believe our boundaries have changed. And I, even though I'm an educator, I am a T in the Myers-Briggs. I'm not really a F. And in this role, especially, I wear my T hat. And to me, to mothball a building for $300,000, I can't even bet. And so I will be reversing, but I have learned, and I'm too going to be needing to explain to my board but I do believe what Lori pointed out earlier can be a strong support in the fact that if you can truly, Perpich Center, help us with arts education in our districts, and I need one in November for a bond <laughs> referendum on a theater, okay? Then I believe it's a partnership. And that's what I'm looking forward to, and I believe that's what a collaboration should do, is build partnerships. Um, um, I just wanted to comment that um, this has been a very lengthy process that we've gone through as a board. And I appreciate everybody's putting forward their best effort and really considering all the pieces all along. I felt that this whole process for me has been very favorable on the board. I felt people expressed themselves and, and worked as a board should work. And I've been very proud to be part of this board. I'm also proud of the parents and the staff and the teachers through this very difficult process, the commitment, the belief, and all the work that has been invested um, would really like to thank everybody, including clearly the perfect staff and what they've pulled together um, in the last six weeks, well, really the last six months, but in particular, as we asked them to think about contracting for the service so that the school could continue. Um, and uh, just, it's been an a impressive experience of how we can work together um, in an appropriate way.
my um, board members will not have a lot of explaining to do when I go back because um, as I've listened to some of the parents and other folks who spoke in the open forum and have quoted uh, poets and uh, movies and songs throughout the uh, entire process, I'm going to take a little quote from Jerry Maguire and say, to the parents of uh, Harambe and Crosswinds and to the Purpich folks, you had me at hello. <laughs> um, I do agree um, also with my counterparts and say that students do equal revenue. That is what we all know to be true back in our home districts. But they also equal the hearts and minds of tomorrow. And it is my hope that those hearts and minds will take their creativity and their innovation and spread it uh, throughout the entire state of Minnesota uh, for many, many years to come. And as our last open forum speaker um, pointed out, you do have to say things three times before it sinks in. I'm hoping this is my third time that I say yes and that it goes forward and sinks in. <laughs> On occasion, I say, I must have a big magnet on my back that says controversy. <laughs> I have just been through and still am in the midst of a controversy regarding a daycare which has lost contact with its sponsor and trying to rein that back in. And needless to say, that has been just about as difficult as the Crosswind situation has been. Since the board has decided that we will keep the school open, I certainly will support Perpich as being the group to take care of that. The easy vote for me would be to vote yes on this resolution. The easy vote for me for the last resolution would have been to vote yes as well. Um, there's a few things that I just struggled with in the last six weeks, and the main issue has been the legislature's decision not to act on this legislation. And being a creature uh, that admires the legislative process and is immersed in the legislative process, I don't like the idea of trying to find a way to go around the legislative outcome. Um, again, the legislature had full opportunity to enact the legislation that was presented to it uh, during the session, was uh, heard in one house and not the other. Uh, we have a bicameral legislature, it requires two houses of the legislature to act. Um, even the one house never had a full opportunity on the floor of the house to take action on that legislation. Um, that's my number one concern, is I don't want to uh, take action here that may be perceived. Again, I, it's, it's pro probably entirely legal because I looked at the Perpich statute and the Perpich statute says um, uh, not, but not limited to. Um, when it defines the role of the Perpich uh, state agency, it defines what it can do, but it does have the, that one clause, but not limited to. And I believe that's what the lawyers are ha hanging their head on and saying that uh, because the statute says, but not limited to 11-12 uh, program, but not limited to a school of 310 students, but not limited to a uh, school that includes an equal number of uh, participants from each congressional district. They're hanging their head on that, but not limited to. And again, how, how far can you stretch that? If, Marilyn brought up the issue of a child care center. If a child care center were going to be closed, could they hang their hat on but not limited to and take management of the child care center? Um, you know, again, I, I just think if the legislature wanted Crosswinds to remain open, they would have taken action on the legislation that was presented to it. 
and I don't feel that I feel as a board member and a person that has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of Minnesota that I can in good conscience uh, vote for this resolution. My other concern, you know, I probably could have overcome that concern if that was my only issue. My other concern is my inability to believe the numbers that we were shown tonight. Um, you know, I've been on a school board for 18 years now, 17 years now, and uh, going on my 18th year, and I know what it takes to run a school district and to run a school program. And how, I just can't understand how you can, and, that, and if it's true, I really do want to talk to Perpich about taking over the management of South Washington County Schools. Because if you can indeed take the revenues that we're receiving from the state and run a school program where you have class sizes between 10 and 24 in each class, um, I want to know how they do it. And I want to be able to transfer some of those abilities uh, to South Washington County. But I, I just doubt whether those numbers add up. Um, and so that's another reason why I'm reluctant to vote yes tonight. Um, the third reason is that two years ago, I was one of the strongest proponents of keeping crosswinds open. Um, when the board was considering closing crosswinds and from May two years ago, I said, let's give it another two years. And I fought on the board to do that because I do think crosswinds has been very, very successful in achieving the integration model. Um, two, two years ago, when this issue was brought before the EMIT board, I did it my own uh, observation, and I went to Crosswinds uh, during lunch hour one day, and I saw what was described to me tonight uh, as true integration, <laughs> voluntary integration by the students, uh, where you look at the tables and you see students of all races, of all income levels, sitting together, enjoying one another's company, and learning from one another. And then I went to Park, uh, excuse me, Woodbury High School. I didn't uh, make it over to Park High School, but I went to Woodbury High School, my home school, the, uh, the district that I come from. And I went to the lunchroom. It was a very different lunchroom. It was, again, voluntary segregation, where the students picked their own tables. You saw uh, clusters of black African-American students. You saw clusters of a table with Hispanic students. You saw clusters of Asian students. And you did see some mixed race tables, but usually when it was a mixed race table, there were one or two uh, people of color sitting at a table of all white students. And again, that was what I consider voluntary segregation because no school said that's how you have to sit in the lunchroom. It was a student's choice to sit where they want to sit, as it was a student's choice at Crosswinds to sit where they want to sit. So I really felt that Crosswinds did achieve uh, a miracle and uh, was able to operate a model school for integration. And earlier this year, I tried to uh, keep Crosswinds going for one more year under EMID management. Uh, you know, again, my, that, that resolution failed. I moved that resolution back in January to extend the closing date to uh, June 30th, 2014. And uh, when that resolution failed, um, then we got into the issue of whether or not uh, we could get legislation passed and the like um, to convey the school to Perpich. And we gave them initial to, initially till April 1st, and then the legislative state of Minnesota actually extended that, saying uh, that was a moot point, and they literally had till June 3rd, or the end of the legislative session to get the conveyance uh, language passed. And when that didn't happen, I think every legislator that was aware of what was going on assumed that Crosswinds was going to close um, because the legislation didn't pass. Um, and I, again, going back to that uh, concern of mine is I don't want to go against what I consider to be legislative intent of what they, uh, and the concerns have been expressed that it was just uh, certain members of the Senate who opposed the conveyance of crosswinds to Perpich because they wanted it to go to District 833. Well, when I talked with members of the Senate who had expressed concerns, 
that was not the motivating factor. It was one of the motivating factors, but it was not the primary motivating factor. There were other factors that the Senate had uh, considered in not putting forth that legislation through the committee process and uh, for a vote by the full Senate and then also for a vote by the full House. So again, the easy vote for me tonight would be to vote yes, but I, I've stated the reasons why I'm voting no. Um, quite frankly, I'm happy that I'm in the minority because, uh, again, uh, what I would like to see happen is crosswinds go forward, but uh, in good conscience, I can't vote for that for the reasons stated. Chair, mine will be short and sweet for all my reasons. And I just know, looking out at the people here that believe in diversity and believe in integration, will also have some understanding of those of us who didn't vote the way they felt. Personally, I won't vote the way that I know all of you wish I would. But I would hope that I'd still have your respect and your um, understanding of how different people are. And that's important. And you know that probably more than others. So I hope we continue to work together. Um, and I don't expect any applause because I know how disappointed you would be in me. But that's, the respect is what I hope is still there. I think I've been um, quite clear on my uh, commitment and support of a proposal that would keep a, our schools open and maintain the integrity and purpose of an inter-district integration program um, as, the, as was the intent of the uh, legislation that established the schools. Um, I still have a strong commitment to an inter-district integration program and I hope, I, I anticipate that it's going to benefit all of our districts uh, that are part of the collaborative. Uh, in good conscience, I could not vote to mothball a building and expect EMID to use $300,000 approximately to maintain that. Uh, board members, thank you for your reflection um, on this issue and uh, your integrity, and no matter how your votes go. Um, and at this time, I'll call for a uh, roll call vote, Mary. Uh, yes is to approve the contract with Perfect Center. Amy Williams. Yes. Marilyn Forsberg. Yes. Jeff Byron Schwab. Yes. Cindy Nordstrom. Yes. Kitty Goggins. Yes. Lori Swanson. Yes. John Broderick. Yes. Marilyn For Marilyn, I'm just sorry. Karen Moorhead. No. Jim Galvin. No. George Hefner. Yes. The vote is eight to two. Okay, an eight to two vote, and it passes uh, approving the contract with the Purpose Center. Uh, good luck. We do have a couple other items on the agenda uh, this evening. Um, our first is the approval of the 2013-14 Food Service Agreement for Harambe Elementary. Uh, Sherry? Thank you. Uh, this is really rather a housekeeping item. This is, don't worry, you won't have to approve another contract for food service for corporate for uh, next month. Uh, this is a this is be, because the food service that we currently operate at Harambe has been operated by St. Paul. So in order for the dollars to flow forward as they as they will or should uh, through Roosevelt, um, we need to um, approve a contract or adapt a, a contract with Roosevelt so that uh, they can do the reporting and the state allows them to uh, collect the reimbursements. Uh, to which they are entitled. So this is very similar to what we've done in the past with St. Paul. We do not need to do this uh, with Crosswinds because EMID already has a food service account set up that Perpich will report through. They will do the reporting through EMID because we're required, they're required to report through EMID. So 
Um, again, it's just similar to the arrangement we've had with St. Paul uh, because Roseville will be providing those services. Okay, could I get a motion to approve this food service agreement? So moved. Byron, second. Second. Cindy, any comments, questions for Sherry? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank Same. you. <coughs> Abstaining. Get that. Thank you. Uh, approval of the extension of employee contracts expiring on June 30th, 2013. Sherry. Uh, these items also. Uh, these are items that are based on a fiscal year as far as contracts go. So those expire June 30th. Um, we uh, were asking uh, you to just extend those appointment contracts to various dates in August uh, so that we can complete the school year. Um, and then many of these individuals will have employment, um, uh, will have employment opportunities or contracts then beginning uh, with either Roseville or Burbage, um down the road. But this is, allows us to finish out our year of business. Okay, could I get a motion to extend those work agreements? So moved. Marilyn, second. second Jim. Any comments, questions for Sherry? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board forum. Uh, no report. Amy? No report. Lori? Just very quickly, I'd like to congratulate the uh, Crosswinds staff and students and families who all participated and made a great success of West Side Story. I was invited to a production by one of the, the parents and um, thank them greatly. It was fabulous. The acting, the singing, the dancing were amazing by these middle school students. The sets were beautiful and I, I just congratulate you all. It was a fabulous production. So congratulations. Cindy? I alluded to the bond that we're putting out in November and we unanimously, we've been doing a facility study for about 18 months and the board unanimously approved going out for a bond of about 30, 31 million dollars. And it covers academics, athletics, and the arts. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share that I had an opportunity to attend the referendum session put on by MSBA. And if anybody's going to be doing a referendum this fall, you need to really make sure you understand the intricacies of the $300 board approved referendum and the $454 board approved referendum because it is not straightforward. And actually, there, it, each district, it makes a difference on a lot of different dimensions, whether it's the right thing to do or not. Um, and so I just want to mention that uh, in case you're going, because I think a number of school districts are going out for a referendum. I know we are this year. Um, I want people to be aware of that. Thank you. Marilyn? Our 16 room additional classrooms are well underway, and hopefully they will be finished to be used by fall. And I attended the 916 groundbreaking of their Kerner Blue Education Center, which is located in Blaine, which is to serve the northeast part of that 916 district. Uh, that will be completed by a fall a year from now in 14. Thank you. Byron? No. Karen? I've just mentioned our EMT program. We had a very successful program the last number of years. And when the 18-year-olds that are still in school take that test, they're certified to uh, be medical technicians, and seven out of seven that took the test passed. So we're very proud of the program and the students. Thank you. Jim? Since people have talked about referendums, uh, we did get caught up in the legislation, and we actually are on the wrong side of the legislation for renewal referendums um, because our referendum expires this fall. Um, the effective date isn't until next year if you have an. Uh, uh, referendum of expiring in the fall of 2014, or in 2014, um, then you are able to use the $300. But because our referendum expires this year, actually, we, we have to go for renewal. So we're looking at both a renewal, we're looking at uh, increase, and we're looking at an $8 million bond referendum 
uh, for purchasing purchase, purchasing land for both a middle school and an elementary, right? because we see the growth trends that we are going to need a middle school and an elementary uh, in the coming years. We will not build on that land immediately, but we've learned from past uh, history that it's better to buy the land when it's farmland than when it's in the middle of a develop development and you're paying uh, a good sum per acre compared to what you're going to pay now. Um, so we're being looking forward and saying let's buy the land at about 80 acres um, uh, for $8 million now as opposed to buying 80 acres for $16 million when we actually need it. Good luck with three questions. <laughs> we may have a fourth question as well that has not yet been decided. May the Lord be with you. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to speak a little bit uh, tonight, you know, when, when uh, you, you put a building together, whether it's a house or an office building or whatever, you need a strong foundation. And uh, I guess since the first meeting that I came to the EMIT board and and uh, like, if you can think back to your uh, first meetings here, um, you're a little bit befuddled and it was very uh, uh, nice of uh, Mary not to laugh at us um, as we stumbled in and, and knew very little about uh, what we were doing. Um, and she has certainly um, kind of kept the board uh, in check from meeting to meeting, uh, let us know uh, what's coming. Uh, worked with um, uh, superintendents. I'm sure when, when you started you didn't uh, expect to be working with as many superintendents um, as you worked with, but as we uh, funneled through um, the many that we did, um, you always were very professional in what you did um, with the superintendents and with the board. So, And I know we even talked you into a couple extra months. I don't think you intended on being here on July 10th. So. Uh, thank you for that as well, but I think just being one of the foundation pieces so that uh, the board could go forward with, with their business um, over the last years, uh, we certainly appreciate that and we do have a little gift for you in parting. Um, so, <laughs> applause would probably be appropriate. And you've probably heard this before, too. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Amy's got the second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Oh, there is cake over there for uh, those of you that need a filling for your sweet tooth.